We couldn't do it. Aye. Right. Another pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. I want to start off the evening by just uh, letting everyone know I'm having a bit of a hearing issue. So if you hear me screaming and yelling, you just tell me to calm down. And if you wouldn't all mind, if, uh, board members and folks in the audience, if you could just speak up a little bit too, I'll do the best I can here. But I'm working through it, and uh, hopefully in a week or two I'll be back. So to open the uh, meeting, we're going to start out with the board member reports. Do we have any? Anybody? These two ladies are stole. I'm not going to steal your thunder, but you were my board member report. So, you want to go right to the podium? You guys are public comment. Yeah. Uh, Michael, regarding the water, we have a meeting on the 25th. On the 25th. In Andover, yes. Are we still making progress with the parcel? Uh, we're trying to uh, arrange a face-to-face we'll -face meeting, meeting with them. to bring yeah. it. We need to another conclusion meeting. at this point. Do we have a backup plan? Yes. Thank you. We Anything need to uh, expand upon that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you want to expand upon it? No. 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 Okay. Anything else? Any other? Please just identify yourself for folks listening in the hall. I'm Nancy Parsons, Damon Street. I'm Ellen Wilklansky from Two Shenandoah Road. And we are here just as a courtesy call to let you know of a project that is taking off in town, a very important project, and uh, we are looking for your enthusiasm and support. We are um, in the process of establishing a new home for the North Reading Food Pantry. Now let me give you just a little bit of background. The Union Congregational Church will be celebrating its 300th anniversary next year. And as part of the celebration, an important part of the celebration, we want to remind the town of our joint historical uh, relationship. So we decided that we wanted to give a significant gift to the town. And we decided that a new home, much needed home for the food pantry would be the very thing. So the church has given a historic building, which is on the premises, the Board of the Food Pantry and the 300th Anniversary Committee have joined to spearhead a capital campaign to raise money. And the town seems to be giving us enthusiastic support, and we're delighted about that. And uh, I'm going to give each of you, before I sit down, just a little mini brochure so that you will have a little bit more information. And if you want any questions answered, uh, you can talk to Ellen McClancy. <laughs> okay, I am a, um, the, the chair of the board of the food pantry, and I've been a volunteer at the pantry for 13 years, I think. Um, and we're very grateful to Town Hall for giving us that little tiny stage <laughs> in, the, in the gym. And the gym is used for other purposes, and we make it work, and we've been very grateful to have been here. We will be, it will be very nice to be in space of our own. And it was the church's idea to give that um, property to the, to let the food pantry use that property. It came from the church. It didn't come from the pantry for the initial idea. And we were very grateful to have that gift fall into our lap. So it does need some renovations um, and that's what the capital campaign is about. The church will still own the building. The food pantry will use it um, and use it well. And I think it's a great space for us because we're near um, the Senior Center and near Peabody Court and, and still a, a public enough space where people who, can, who need to use the pantry can go there without any stigma attached, no big flashing lights that say food pantry. So it's a win-win it's a all the way around. And thank you very much for having let us be here for as many years as we've been here. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. And thanks, guys. I, full disclosure, I, I'm a member of the church and helping out with the program as well. Um, what the church intends to do is lease it to the food pantry for a dollar a year. So the church will maintain ownership. But, so and Ellen, it's yeah. how, how much is this going to increase your space by? It's like, it's. How well the. the, the um, you can throw a microphone? If you can. Okay. Um, 
very cognizant of your time here. The gym is 435 square feet. I mean, the stage is 435 square feet. We do use space in the gym. We have our refrigerator and freezer out there, and we put up tables and take them down when we're not using them. Um, but this will have 1,100 square feet on the first floor, and then there'll be a second story that we can use for storage. We have been known to store things off-site, which is... And we'll be ADA compliant as well. ADA compliant. We hope we'll have a dumb waiter so that, because I don't think the demographics of our volunteers is going to change much. So um, we don't want people walking up and down stairs with cases of green beans. So it's, it, it's, a, it's way more space, and we'll be able to store everything we need there. Yes, it will be ADA compliant. There'll be a, yes, it'll be one story. Be perfect. I just want to thank the uh, food pantry for all their efforts through all these years and what they do. And I have one other announcement. The uh, uh, Friends of the Council on Aging are running their annual uh, town-wide yard sale. There's about 60 participants, and there are maps available identifying where these locations are at Ryers, at the library, at Tom Hall, and at the Senior Center. And this is on this Saturday morning. I think it begins at 9, if I oh, get it it's correct. It's a great event. But before you run, Ellen, mm -hmm. and all the folks from the Union Congressional Church, Congregational Church, excuse me, I cannot thank you enough because, you know, you did a lot out of that little five, 600 square feet or whatever we gave you back there. Uh, but it's such a great service to the community. And I'm, hoping, I'm so happy to see that it's growing and that you can continue to serve because it, it is a big part of what we do in town. And I'm here to support whatever you need. I'm sure all the other board members as well. And uh, Tom Hall, thank you for always taking good care of the space that we uh, we provided. You've always, you've always kept it so clean. And the volunteers put away those tables and chairs a hundred times. And I'm just so happy to hear they don't have to do that anymore. Thank you. And I'm sure they're happy about it as well. And what's the Thank timeline? You. What's the timeline we're talking about? What's, what's your goal or hope to? Well, the goal, we do have to raise some money, and we have to renovate the building. So, and this is a construction project. So the, the goal is to have it done by June of 2020. But okay. it is a construction project. So it could be a groundbreaking at that date, or it could be a ribbon cutting, or somewhere in between those two things. But our goal is June of 2020. It's not a lot of hard work for the renovation necessarily, but um, we know how those things go. Yeah. And as far as the, the expense, as far as the, how much do you need to raise, do you figure? Just to give, give the community an idea. Um, oh, I didn't. No. Yes, sir. Okay. That's $220,000. Right. Nancy's. Um, it is. It's $220,000. Uh, we are on the way. Uh, we have uh, pledges of in excess of $60,000 already. And we're rolling. That's great. Tell your friends. And there's also monies from the estate that also left money to the town as well. I'm sorry? The, the estate money that was left um, as well. The, the same estate that left money oh, to the Mr. town. Oh, Charlie? Charlie, yeah. Well... Charlie was very good to the church, as he was to the town. And um, because we're doing, able to do a lot of these renovations, because we're moving the parsonage into Charlie's house, the present parsonage will be demolished, uh, and we will have parking improvements, which will benefit the food pantry as well. So, you know, it's all of a piece. Right. That's great. That's great. And again, to the church that for what they're doing here what a trem tremendous service uh, a yeah. gift to the town and it's a wonderful thing and again for the service that you've all provided over the years extremely grateful Thank well you. read your brochures and any questions you have you just ask Ellen <laughs> it's to make Thank checks you. payable to the home fund slash CCS PO box 626 North Reading Mass 01864 for the food pantry home fund that's right. It'd be great to get more than 220000 too, so you have a little bit of we'll additional capital. We'll, we'll thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. All right. We are at the hour of the Board of Liquors, the package store, all alcohol. Uh, we are at 1134 Lake Street, Lake Street, Lake Street.
Mr. Chairman, in accordance with Chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws, a public hearing will be held by the Select Board in Room 14, Town Hall, 235 North Street, on Monday, April 22nd, 2019, at 7.15 p.m., on the application of Lowell Street Corporation, DBA Eastgate Liquor Store, for a change of location for the package store all alcohol license, license to be exercised at 20C Main Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, one floor consisting of cold chest, retail space, redemption area, and backroom storage for a total of 12,630 square feet. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Chairman, through you, this is a, an application for a change of location for Eastgate Liquors. I believe uh, most in the community are familiar with the changes going on at the site uh, at the intersection of Park and Main Street uh, with the opening of the uh, new CVS behind the existing Eastgate Liquors location. The applicant is petitioning to move the uh, store to the former CVS location in the plaza. Um, we've reviewed the application. It appears to be in order. We have uh, circulated it for departmental feedback and have not received any concerns. Um, we have one uh, holdout uh, in the health department only because the uh, director wasn't immediately available to report back, but we don't expect any issues um, from them. And through you, Mr. Chair, I don't know if we'll hear directly from the applicant relative to their intentions, but that's the summary. If the applicant has anything to say, it's up to you. you know, Perhaps an estimated timeline that, I'm sorry? Perhaps they would want to offer an estimated timeline for the move. If you wouldn't mind maybe sitting here at the mic, we're going to ask you a quick question. Would you mind just giving us a quick timeline? Sure. When you think everything will be completed. It's the same way Can you just say your name for the sure. record? Sure. My name is Paul Robinson. I'm the manager of Eastgate currently. Um, so the time frame in regards to um, us being out of there, about July 7th is the time frame we were trying to shoot for a little bit beforehand. Um, then we're talking about the demo after that, and that's by August 6th, so a month after that, after we move out, and then that would be about it. It's pretty simplistic, but, you know, it's good. Mr. So when would the store open in its new location, in your estimation? Um, we're shooting for the first week of July. Okay. And it looks wonderful over there. They've done a great job with uh, the CBS. I'm sure it will continue right along. Yeah, I think it's important to note that, you know, throughout this move, there's been an awful lot of construction and on-site uh, issues that they've had to deal with, and not the least of which is weather and uh, gas gas issues, trying to get the gas to the building and uh, the new, new structure and all the rest. But uh, I also want to just acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, Mr. Lucci and his team working with the neighborhood behind there over the last uh, <coughs> year, you know, in order to... Uh, address their concerns and needs have uh, done no one's work in relation to that. And we know we can't satisfy everybody, but we know that the efforts have been made, the outreach has been uh, tremendous, and the communication level has been very good. So um, we wish you nothing but success. Thank you. Anyone else have a question on this heart on this hearing? Anyone else? Procedurally, do we have to wait till 7.30? No, 7.15. Okay. Right, it was 7.15. Yeah, I'm the guy Christopher's, I'm sorry, you're right. Yep. Then for the comment, so I move, to, I move, the to, move to close the public hearing. And I'll take a motion, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve a change of location for the package store all alcohol license for Eastgate Liquors from 14 Main Street to 20 C Main Street. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay, you're all set. Thank you very Thank much for your time. They'll get something in the mail? Or they come by and pick something up? Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have signed the May Town Election Warrant. Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Chairman, uh, through you, there is a copy of the warrant which the board must sign to uh, uh, commission the election, the annual uh, town election. Constable is here. Thank you, Mr. Ferriello, for your time. Uh, we took a motion that is in the meeting packet. I would ask the board to vote and sign. Mr. Chairman. I move to sign the May 7th, 2019 town election warrant. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. While we're getting signatures, I just wanted to kind of go back to the board member reports. I just want to remind everybody that uh, the Memorial Day Parade and Service is on May 27th. The board continues uh, to participate in that, so board members, uh, and then after the election, whoever the, uh, the, the two new board members just need to be uh, 
made aware of the board's participation on the Memorial Day, Monday, May 27th. Uh, traditionally, the board selects one member to speak during the services. So if somebody could just take a note to take care of that action after May 6th, uh, I think it's important for them to know. If you know prior to that, that would be fine. But uh, I think they need to know by May 10th. Okay, it's the 7.30 hour, Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, in accordance with Chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws, a public hearing will be held by the Select Board in Room 14 Town Hall, 235 North Street, on Monday, April 22, 2019, at 7.30 p.m. on the application of, uh, excuse my pronunciation here, Divyanch, uh, Incorporated DBA Christopher's Market for a change of directors, officers, and a change of manager for the package store, wine, and malt beverage license. License to be exercised at 2 Washington Street, North Reading, Massachusetts. Okay. The power of your hearing is open. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, as uh, hearing notice reads, there are two actions that are being requested from the board to approve the change of directors and change of managers for the store. Um, I believe the applicant is here, and if uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, it might be beneficial for us to hear a brief summary from them. Okay. Sure. Uh, good evening. My name is Attorney John Moradi in Democus Law Offices in Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, Diviash Incorporated, DBA Christopher's Market, and with me is uh, Prashant Kumar Patel, and uh, to the goodbye Patel. Uh, they are the co-owners of Christopher's Market. Um, today we're seeking uh, two, two, um, two requests. One is a change of director. We're removing uh, Meena Patel as director and replacing with Prashant Kumar Patel. And number two is we're changing the manager of record of the premises from Nitin Patel to uh, Prashant Kumar Patel. Uh, Prashant is a, um, they purchased the store uh, January of 2018. Um, and we're doing some paperwork here to update uh, Prashant on the paperwork. Um, he is TIP certified. Um, he's been working at the store uh, close to 40 plus hours a week. Um, they have um, ID scanners. They've had no issues with underage service. Um, um, so with that, I welcome any questions you may have on the, uh, on the request. Mrs. Minipelli? Are you related? Are you a family? Friends, eh? Friends, yeah. Friends. I'm, sh and I'm sure it's on. I'm sure it's on the application. I'm trying to scroll through as quickly <laughs> as I can. But since you've been there prior to this retail uh, establishment, have you worked in other locations selling alcohol? Yes, I did. Uh, Where? Uh, Franklin, Mass. Uh, helped out my family on the liquor store. For uh, well, I moved here a couple years back, so I was helping out while I'm um, transition to purchasing this business. So I, I am a frequent flyer of that establishment, mm -hmm. and I will say the renovations you've done in there and the reorganization that's done it, you've done a wonderful job. It looks really nice. And I do wish you the best of luck with it. 
under the new change in management if it passes, which I hope it does. Any other questions? Concur with the chair. I've, I've been in there as well, and you guys did a nice job, Thank you know, improving the place. Ms. Minipel, you want a few more minutes? Are you good? No, no. I just okay. If I close the hearing, just one more right. comment is that a lot of kids hang out in that plaza. A lot of yeah. kids, you know. So just be be mindful of that. And yes. mm -hmm. um, I think the system of sales with the can I say something? Of course. Uh, I've been here. I've been living in North Reading for a year now. So my oldest son, you know, he's going to start school. So, you know, I'll be living here for a long time, you know, so. Uh, That's uh, great. And I usually send a lot of kids back, you know, they come try to buy letters and stuff, and I always check IDs. So, I'm, I'm strictly there 90% of the time, so, you know. Yes, I see you there a lot. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Okay. Move to close, I'm close the public hearing. I'll close the hearing. Take a motion, Mr. Larry. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve a change of directors and change of manager for the package <coughs> store wine and malt beverage license for Christopher's Market. Second. Second. I have a motion to second by Mrs. Mignopelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. You're all Thank set. You can probably Same provide tomorrow, place. Jane, to get Two it. Places. Oh, they need longer. But tomorrow? Well, tomorrow. Goes to ABC. Yeah. Um, Wednesday? Usually, no, actually, usually we send the local licensing review record to the ABCC, and then they approve it. Then they approve and when it. they approve it, and they okay. get the license. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for coming in this evening. All right. Uh, so we have about 25 minutes before the 8 o'clock CIPC review. So what I'd like to do is, um, Mr. Cabrera, do you have any suggestions we'd like to go through, maybe review the increase of fees, or so you like the wait? I'm expecting the building inspector, although I can tell you he was out ill uh, today, but I am expecting him to be joining us for that discussion. And I believe that there are a couple of members of the Finance Committee who may stay after the Capital Improvement Planning Committee discussion for items 10 and 11. So I would suggest maybe item 12. Uh, 12 Joe, and Tom 13? Meeting, Tom meeting warrants? Sure. Yeah. I was thinking, actually, we're doing 12 and 13, so. Okay, great. We can take either order, whatever you want to do. Uh, why don't I go through the town meeting warrants, because this will be the first time we've talked in detail, sure. particularly about um, funding for the uh, for the articles. There would be one moment, Mr. Chair. Everybody has them in the meeting packet. Mr. Chairman, through you, the uh, warrant begins on page 72 of the packet, and uh, it is a, a current draft. Um, you may note that in a previous version, we had the descriptions on the warrant. Uh, we do not customarily ask the board to sign a version of the warrant with descriptions on them, so we remove them, but we will add them back when the draft that is going to the printer is being prepared later in the process. Probably the most significant thing that I should note, and uh, it was in the meeting notes, is that we have three examples of the uh, so-called plastic bag ban or reduction bylaw. They begin on page 81 of the packet. Um, Town Council was able to provide us basically three alternatives for the board to look at. I don't know whether the board members have uh, reviewed it or discussed it, um, or if the board members would like to receive a recommendation from um, the administration. <coughs> Uh, at the moment, we do not have an, a recommendation to offer as to which one of those three. Uh, we were leaving it to the board, but we're, I'm happy to report a recommendation if there isn't an objection to any one of them at the next meeting. Um, Just uh, what are the again? I didn't have a chance to, to review it. What would be the differences between the uh, the samples? Uh, so I, I don't. I would say that the significant differences were uh, some in the con construct of the fines. So how do you, you know, how do you punish people for noncompliance? That's uh, one area. Um, I believe there was a difference in the enforcing uh, authority as well, and that's something I've talked with the, with the health director that it may be something that could be enforced out of the, the public works department or out of the board of health. Um, how are other communities doing? Because a lot of the surrounding communities already have this in, in place. How, how is that being implemented in other communities and what's their experience has been? Um, so I think the, the experience has probably been the most prevalent is it, it's challenging to educate people. Um, you know, the, the, that's a lot of the feedback that I heard from my counterparts when I initially started the conversation with them. 
getting people familiar with what the, um, the requirements are. Um, obviously, you know, there is an impact on the business community. I read recently that there was a, a nearby community where there was a, a movement afoot to, to uh, repeal um, the, um, the, the bylaw. But I think just the education, I mean, it's a significant change, obviously, and I, I think at one point it was sort of our thinking within the town hall that there would be uh, a change in conjunction with a more significant change in solid waste collection. But we're not looking to make any such change on that right now, so we'd be handling this separately, which is you know, certainly fine. Um, I, I think you know maybe to move the conversation along, it might be helpful if we give a, a, a recommendation as to how we would see it being enforced and which of the versions would be enforced for the board to consider at the next meeting. Um, I, but I'm not prepared with that this evening because I, I don't want to. Just Mr. Missary. Michael, have you been communication with the vendors in town that would have to change? I, I have not communicated with them at this point. Do you think it would be worthwhile doing? I, I mean, it certainly would be a benefit. The traditional manner would be, um, as we're discussing the, the, the warrant, they may come and participate. Um, the warrant article hearing might be an opportunity for them to come participate. Uh, if the board's asking that we contact you know, proactively, I'm, I'm happy to arrange that through either DPW or the Board of Health. It would seem to me that if town meeting passed whatever language we decided that there should be a time frame associated with getting the businesses to convert. From what I've seen, it's between six and nine months uh, for a lead time to put, get people mm -hmm. up to speed. Okay. But you haven't had an experience, haven't you? Yeah, but you're not going to be happy with my experience. But I'm going to let Mr. Schultz speak, and then I'll I'll just briefly give you my view of it. Go ahead. Uh, just to the town, I did hear I did speak with the executive director of the North Reading Reading Chamber of Commerce, who is strongly are strongly against this bylaw, and I personally am against the bylaw as well. There's a it's a cost to business that just gets passed on to the consumer, and I, Mr. Frisco, as a, as a store owner, could speak to it firsthand. He dealt with it in Boston. I mean, I, I know this isn't that a you know, part of the whole discussion today, but I'll just give you a read to digest version of it. I was a little naive going into it, I will be honest with you, because all the bags we used in our store were biodegradable, they were recyclable, and I really thought I was going to be able to continue to use those bags. But the way the law is written, there's a certain spec now, it's a very tight spec that you have to meet. So there's only so many bags you can use, and those bags went from me paying less than three cents a bag to now the minimum is 13 cents a bag and the larger bags are obviously significantly more and I have to charge it to customers and that's the part that's very challenging is that you don't have a choice our once we pass this law our stores and vendors have to charge the customer and that's part of the data that you have to collect there's no money going to the state but the data has to be collected that you charge for these bags to encourage people to bring their own canvas bags and reusable bags and and I, I agree on that, but what I don't like is what the industry has done, is they've turned this into a, a money opportunity. And my costs have gone up so much that I can't even charge my customers what I pay for the bag because I just don't have it in my heart to do that. So the max we charge is 10 cents for a bag, but I'm paying significantly more than that. And I think what you're going to find in town is our, our local uh, vendors and stores will be inflicted with the same way I am. Yeah. So I think the, their intention was good with this law, but the way it's being executed is hurtful to the business owner. And I think there's a better way of doing it, and I think there's more options out there. And so I'm not going to be in favor of it, but I'm not well, going to be. What are, I'm curious, I, I don't know, what other options would be I think available? what we were using for, the bags we were using were biodegradable and recyclable. They should have left the specs alone to allow those bags to still be used. And what they've done is they moved them to these tolerances that are so thick that the expense now to get those bags are 23 cents a bag or 21 cents a bag. And that's a tremendous amount of money on me. And what we talked about is maybe potentially putting it into the food, but the law doesn't let you do that. You have to charge for the bag. You just have to decide what your pain tolerance is on what you want to push off to the customer. You want to push okay, the whole my, thing? My other, my other question is, do you want to administrator in relation to um, the requirement I don't know where the requirement came from that we would have to that they would have to be tracking the charge of the bags I don't know where that uh, how would that have to be incorporated into our bylaws if we didn't do well that's the whole concept of it right if you charge it makes people say well geez you charge me for bags I'm gonna that. bring it back the next time behind that but I didn't know that it, it, it wasn't aware 
that there's a requirement that they charge for the bags that have been tracked. I don't in know. In Boston, that. there is. Okay. I haven't read our local. laws. I haven't read our laws. Yeah, I mean, I mean so we, we would, I mean, that'd be something that we would be able to control, presumably. I mean, at this point, right. again, yeah, I mean, it I is mean, something I, I think. It wouldn't be something that I would be necessarily. But the impact yeah. really isn't on the customer. It's so, really on the proprietor. In, in that respect, Mr. Chair, you could probably speak this better than I can, but some of the businesses have complained to me that there's only a handful of companies that make these bags that are the new, that meet the new specs. It's only a few. And it's almost like they have like an oligarchy over it. It's like almost like a cartel over the price, and that's what's driving the price. I don't think, Mr. O'Leary, we could dictate the specs. I think that's part of the law that we have we have to do it, Mr. Gabo. General law, or what are we doing? So, Mr. Chairman, you, so th there is a discussion at the state level about this potentially being regulated at the state level, but this would be a local bylaw that yeah. we would set. Uh, town Council did not give us any indication of parameters that the Attorney General has established for, the, uh, for what they will approve or not approve. Uh, but we would, you know, I think with a fair amount of latitude be able to establish that standard. You know, a couple of things I, I should note. I did get initial feedback going back a few months from uh, my counterparts with regard to the implementation. And they reported at that time very few challenges departmentally um, because it's something that, you know, there, there's once the change takes place, it really falls to the, the business to make sure that it's in compliance. Uh, there was little impact reported in the abutting communities that established it. Uh, one thing I did note is in, in a number of those communities, it was uh, something that was established by citizen petition. Obviously, we are ahead of uh, ci potential citizen, peti citizen petition by the board having the discussion. But we really get to establish the standard, as far as I can tell, within the parameters of the approval of the, board, the uh, attorney general. Good. That's good. So, so, so to me, you know, and again, Boston was more stringent. Yeah. Let's put it that way. They were more stringent. Good. We don't have to be as stringent. And to me, it's not, uh, I mean, it's a matter of uh, convenience and inconvenience versus inconvenience. Um, yes, there's some costs associated with that. But, you know, I think to the bigger point and broader point, it's more of the environmental issues mm -hmm. uh, associated with what we're dealing with here. And I think it's important that, uh, that we, again, join the club and, and help facilitate uh, the change at the state level and again by implementing it at the local level and if there is a change at the state level then the implementation of the state regulations would be far easier than a, a quantum leap or a big jump for a, a business that has to come into compliance within a certain deadline so you know I, I recognize that there's some additional costs that are going to be passed on to the consumers you know personally I'm okay uh, with that because uh, the cost of the environment is far greater uh, than the few cents that we're going to have to spend in order to come into compliance with this I mean I don't think that we should be um, putting any additional um, burdens in relation to the type of uh, the extent that the city of Boston took. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, you know, I think if we just implement a simple simple bylaw yeah. uh, requiring that a change, you know, then then the impact isn't as significant as what you're feeling in your business and, yeah. you know, down on the if waterfront. You give the residents, I mean, you give the local vendors a period of time to get to there. Right. You know, give them several months. Yeah. Yeah, let them use up the stock that's there and, you know, I'm not looking to have them throw anything away. You know? So can't we, because you said you had biodegradable plastic bags, why don't we may amend it to allow the, the use of those? I think that out of the three samples, the first sample isn't, doesn't have the really specificity as to those, um, you know, the materials. specifications yeah. and materials. But no matter which one, I, I think that the first one sort of, is the first step forward and I agree with Mr. O'Leary and that we should be doing it because it's going to come it's going to come down the lane anyway and we might as well be getting ready for it but if we could amend it so that it incorporates the it has some ex explanation of the bags but it incorporating permission to use those biodegradable unless in, until there's a law change that we would, may have might have to incorporate which there hasn't been yet I think that's what we could do to make it more of a step-by-step -step process for the business owners. Okay. Mr. Becerra? I, I don't see uh, a big problem with raising the price because if you go into like a stop and shop or something, you, you can bring your own bags in to put yep. the shopping in. So it seemed to me if the price is people looking at it too high, they'll get around to bringing their own bags. Yeah, that's why they it charge you at the while, counter but for the bag. But yeah. yeah. They won't so. raise the price of the product, but they will charge you for every bag they have to provide you. Yeah. And then uh -huh. people will start to see that in the receipts, which my customers are, 
and then I and it has worked. I, don't get me wrong, it has worked. We have, to, I would say now at least 50% of my customers are coming in with their own bag, and the ones they're buying from me, they are keeping. We bought a nice one that folds up to you know very small that you keep in your back pocket. So even the men are coming in with it in their back pocket. So it is working, but the way it was implemented and the types of bags has been very expensive on the vent, uh, on the markets and the stores. No. Any other uh, as far as the Reading uh, North Reading Chamber, uh, Reading implemented it, correct? Yeah, it's not. As far as I know, it's not been very well received by the businesses. I know for a fact. I went to Stop and Shop. Well, this is pre-strike, probably three or four months ago in Reading, walked out with paper bags full of groceries, and I kid you not, every single bag was broke before I could put it in the back of my trunk. I mean, it was, they were flimsy Yeah, we couldn't go and play paper that, for that reason. Yeah, I it's just, I, and I think, I understand the concept of wanting to help the environment, but this is, North Reading banning plastic bags is taking one one hundredth of one percent of one grain of sand off Waikiki Beach. This is not... We're not doing it into the environment. It's de minimis, de minimis, de minimis. And I think we're creating a burden but on if business. It, if, and if each little community does their de minimis portion, all of a sudden it becomes a pretty good the portion of what of needs to be done. Problems so, with recyclables you know, to me it's, uh, from India and Asia, not the, from the U.S. I think if you could yeah. work on this, like Mr. O'Leary suggested, you guys can write this up to where it could be a little friendly on both sides and get to what you achieve the goal you want to, then I think it's probably a reasonable thing. But if it's going to be as restrictive and as strict as the Boston one, I think it's going to be very hurtful. I, I do believe it because I'm living it. Yeah. So. And again, I, I don't I don't know that there's going to be any lobbyists coming into the town of North Reading trying no. to promote some specific product or or uh, type but, of material. But but you got to remember, somebody has to in town also look you know follow up on it. Who's going to do that? It's another added service that you're going to have to. The town administrator is going to be responsible for. Us. You know, how do you do that? Do you do it weekly, monthly, yearly? I mean, there's all that thought that needs to be put into your, whatever you put out there, you need to have a way <laughs> you're right. going to monitor it. That's all. I know they come by my store, and I don't think we're going to have people randomly pumping in stores every single day, but I don't know what you plan to do. Okay? You don't have it in the budget. <laughs> Not at this moment, no. No bag enforcement? No. Um, anything else on the warrant articles? I, I'm assuming we'll get back to that one in the next meeting. I was just going to briefly review the funding and the funding sources for the articles. I'll try to take them in order yeah, go ahead. quickly. So starting with Article 1, the FY 2019 budget amendment. At this point in time, we have two items that we're, we're monitoring. One is um, the uh, results of a bid opening for the replacement of the DPW garage roof. Uh, that was a project that was funded at last year's June town meeting. The bids came in at $40,600 over the allocation for the project. So we are recommending a transfer of free cash into the FY 2019 budget so that we can award that contract and get that project started. The second is uh, some in the community are aware that there is, uh, we did suffer a vehicle loss due to a vehicle fire uh, in, um, in February, a uh, water department utility truck. Fortunately, no injuries, but there was a loss of a truck. Uh, we've received some good news, or it looks like good news from the insurance company that we expect some proceeds on that. And, uh, but we do expect that there will be additional funds <coughs> needed to replace that vehicle, and we're forecasting that at approximately $25,000 um, to be funded from water-retained earnings because it was a water department vehicle. Moving along to Article 3 for transfers of funding into the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund, we're recommending a transfer of $900,000 in free cash, which will be utilized in the Revenue and Expense Plan for fiscal year 2020. We're also recommending an appropriation into the stabilization fund of $500,000 uh, to be funded by free cash. Um, moving forward, um, the next article for which we are recommending funding at this point in time, oh, I, I shouldn't say that. I skipped over one. The water, water stabilization fund, so traditionally as we're looking at funding that's expected to be left over at the end of the fiscal year, we transfer it into the Water Department Stabilization Fund. That won't take place until right up uh, at June Town Meeting when we can project the number a little more accurately. Do we have that in the packet? Uh, yes, I'm on page 87, 87. in the spreadsheet for those who are following along. Um, uh, 73. No, 87. 87, 87? Is, the, is the spreadsheet. The, there's oh, a the spreadsheet. Source. Yeah. 87, you said? 87, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. No problem. Can I just ask? Yeah, excuse me, Mr. Mitchell. Can you just go back to Article Three because you're talking so fast? I missed the first thing. I caught this five hundred thousand a 
of free cash to stabilization, what was the first thing? The first one, uh, funding for $900,000 in free cash for um, the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund. And th that is a transfer into the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund, which will then in turn be appropriated into the budget through the revenue plan for fiscal year 2020. And we skipped over Article 2, too. We don't need that. Uh, at this point, we do not uh, project a deficit. Okay. If you go into that spreadsheet, you can that see it all right uh, there. Reflect the change in what we've been doing for the past three years. Uh, you're <laughs> speaking to Article Three. Drop. Article Three. Uh, it's consistent, I believe, with what we did in last year's budget. Yes. <laughs> I'm in the cassette tape. Continue. I'm in cassette tape. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Minnie Pelly's still in Dropbox, so uh, I apologize. The next article is uh, Article. Seven, which is a transfer to the solid waste stabilization fund much like the water stabilization fund transfer we don't know that number until very close to town meeting at which point we will recommend it um, the participating funding arrangement fund and FY 19 transfer that was improperly or incorrectly listed as a fiscal year 2020 article in the last draft if we were to make that transfer, it would be in fiscal year 2019. However, it's highly likely that we won't be recommending such a transfer and that we will again recommend it in October like we did last year. And that's the point in time when the plan has run out and all the claims have been paid uh, or nearly all the claims have been paid. So we can do that transfer with a higher level of certainty in October rather than June. But we felt it important to leave that on here um, uh, and probably will do so perpetually moving forward in case we are in uh, a position to make that transfer earlier. Uh, there's no funding articles uh, for the next few articles until you get to fiscal year 2020, which is the uh, FY 2020 Chapter 90 Highway Construction Authorization. We are expecting uh, over $500,000 from the state administration this year. Um, prior year bills, you know, we're still monitoring uh, for any potential needs. None to disclose at this point in time, but uh, we'll continue to watch that going up to the town meeting in June. The FY15 operating budget will be, of course, funded out of the revenue and expense plan and the appropriate offsets, which we'll, we'll re, we will review um, later on in the meeting. The FY2020 capital expenditures, uh, the chairman is here, along with some members of the committee that are on their way in, and we'll be reviewing that in a few short minutes. <clears throat> right now, that calls for $941,045 in free cash. And Mr. Kelleher will detail that. The uh, sorry. The uh, revolving funds uh, that was something that was not on the, the last draft that you saw. We have put them on in the format that's been provided us to town council, um, with all of them being considered under the same art, uh, article as they were last year. Going to the next article, rescinding authorization to borrow. We do expect that there may be some projects that are ready to be rescinded, although we have not finalized a, a list at this point in time. Funding our retirement obligations, and this is included in the revenue and expense plan for fiscal year 2020. That's $200,000 to be appropriated out of raise and appropriate. Um, Article 20, transferring funds to the OPEB Excuse liability me, trust. Uh, yeah. Just on that one there, uh, the dollar amount, is this escalating each year as we originally intended, or are we, uh, the, are we drop back? So the, are you referring to the OPEB? Yep. So for the OPEB, we have it at the $300,000, which is the last known number from our actuary. I believe the board will receive an update at its July meeting, and at that point we'll then update it for the next fiscal year. That's generally the cycle we've been working on. And I think it ends up running a two-year cycle because we get that actuary report every two years. Okay. And then as far as the other uh, retirement obligations, that's just what? Was uh, buybacks for uh, retirees for both the school department and the non-school uh, department uh, departments in the town hall. So that, that's a, sh a number split between the, um, the school, uh, public schools budget and the town budget. Um, appropriating money for permitting software. So this would be funding that would allow us to conclude the project and it would be a supplement to the state grant that we received earlier this fiscal year. Uh, it does include funding both for the last piece of the technology as well as the funding for um, staffing um, uh, if needed to, uh, to uh, get the program up and running, whether it be through our own staff or through um, any higher services that are required. Uh, that's a, that th Those are one-time expenses, though, and the uh, annual operating expenses have been incorporated into the operating budget request. Uh, funding Michael, what is the amount on, the, on that article? 
Um, I'd, I'd have to go into the budget, and I don't believe the finance director has that uh, on the article or on the. the on that article. Twenty-six thousand two hundred thirty dollars. Uh, funding repairs to town buildings. That is the customary fifty thousand dollars. That's the customary fifty thousand uh, dollars, which we are seeking to move to the June town meeting rather than the October town meeting, and it is our hope to avoid a need for any funding articles uh, in October, if possible. We're trying to consolidate those actions into the June town meeting uh, as much as possible. Appropriating money for special legal counsel legal expenses. We have the article on there, but we do not have a request for funding at this point in time. Establishing the school district reserve fund. So that would be in a, a, the administrative act of uh, accepting the state statute that allows for that um, fund to be established. And then it is our recommendation to make an initial transfer in to the fund in the amount of $100,000 for the first fiscal year. And then finally, Article 26, which is the uh, Swan Pond Road project. Um, we are still awaiting the sign off from the final uh, abutter, um, who is the owner of two properties. Um, that, that sign off is required for us to be able to complete, or to, to begin and complete the necessary engineering study in the vicinity of the Swan Pond Road area. Um, that is an effort that will take some time, so uh, time is short because we need that report in order to know what the cost is for both the drainage work and we can reasonably project the paving we believe but if there's any surprises this is where we hope to identify them so we can't make a recommendation for the actual cost for the construction until that report is done and I, I do feel it important to advise the board and the community that we, we are still trying to work through and we're optimistic but time is short um, do, so. do you know if that uh, particular butter uh, there's just one of butter that's holding out up there. It's just one now? What, there was one at the very end that hasn't changed, but there's one somewhere towards the middle. It's two parcels. It owns two parcels. It's 80 feet total uh, on the road uh, that has refused to, to sign off on anything. And it's holding up the, the progress of the, of the uh, analysis of the site. Uh, my, my question is, of that 80 feet that we're talking about, is there what's it look like from a drainage standpoint? Is that one of the parcels or part of the frontage that would require a significant amount or just minor? Um, I hate to do this to the town engineer who so innocently walked in here, but perhaps he may be able to attempt to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, John Flippel, town engineer. Uh, that piece is kind of, it's right in the middle pretty much. Um, as far as drainage goes, a lot of the more substantial drainage work is past that piece. Um, so you kind of have to go over the property to get to the piece. This form is the right of entry to be able to allow the town to work on the property. So you kind of can't go through the property to get to where we kind of need to be. Well, we have a right of access to, to do the analysis on all the other parcels. And if it's not a significant portion in relation to the drainage issues specifically, um, then it really shouldn't. And I know we told Tom Meeting we were looking to get a sign off from everybody. But what you have here is 99.9% .9 of the people up there signed off on it. You've got one holdout, uh, truly, that's uh, being an impediment at this point. And if it's not critical, you know, can we do some analysis without that 80 feet of furniture <coughs> if it's not going to be a critical piece of drainage? If that's the board's pleasure to do, we can certainly see what can be done. You kind of want to analyze the entire site. As far as I'm aware, that those that, that portion is kind of like the high point, and then the, the road goes down after that and comes back up. So that's kind of like one of the beginning collectors of that drainage area, and that's where the main wetland crosses under the road, which is right after that. Yeah, just beyond it. Right. Mr. Masseri? As I recall, there were a couple sections where the current road goes through the middle of lots. What are we doing to resolve that? We put, the plan would be to put the road through those lots as they currently stand? As they currently stand. That, that was the intention at the end of the community meetings and the select board discussions last uh, last year, which, you know, as I've noted previously, puts this outside of the, tr the traditional betterment process, but it does reduce the, the cost to, for the project because you would not be surveying the properties or 
otherwise doing anything. If the person or landowner that's holding off, but they won with a rose going through their property? Arguably the worst offender. What? <laughs> <laughs> the, the property is bisected almost diagonally with the, the road. Michael, are we going to address this on May 6th again? Yeah, and then this is so the last If option. we could maybe take some action, a little more work on it. Mr. O'Leary, you have some specific stuff you want them? Well, to I, again, my, my, the reason for my question was, you know, how critical is this? And, and again, the most expensive portion of what we're talking about here is drainage. You know, so it didn't appear to me that this is a, a critical stretch of the road in relation to the drainage. It's beyond it that uh, we need to do a little more analysis. If that's the case, you know, I hate to see the whole thing uh, be thrown out the window because of, you know, one person being stubborn. In that regard, Michael, can we get an opinion from town council on how to deal with the one parcel? Because I don't, I don't think we should be going through and doing anything without, if they haven't agreed. I think that's dangerous to private property right. But do we have any mechanism for dealing with it? Because I agree with Mr. O'Leary. It is a shame if this isn't going to be done because of one person. So effectively what we're asking is, you know, for them to sign off on a document that would state that they would both allow us to go on the property to conduct the surveying that we need to do. And it also includes a preliminary approval of the property being paved once the final plan is identified. And so that, that is a, I think we've identified that that's a sort of catch-all where they get another opportunity to say, yeah, yeah, I agree with what you're going to do, or no, I don't, because in the end, we need to get approval for the, that they're going to pay the, their share of the cost if it's going to be funded that's by the about the, 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 I, 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 I think, uh, it's my understanding, uh, is that, uh, if they don't want to incur any cost, period, uh, but they're not opposed to it being paid, they just don't want to pay for it. The other, the other residents up there are willing to share the cost in order to do it. So I just don't think we can do it with one piece. So maybe, um, are we still the uh, person supporting this article? We're sponsoring it? It's correct, yes. Mrs. Mitchell. Why don't we, for that particular owner, uh, modify that right of entry to exclude, you know, the preliminary agreement to pay just so we can get the surveying portion done or the engineering portion done. I mean, it, um, it really isn't fair to the other people, but the other people have already agreed they're going to chip in anyway. So maybe this one particular person just wants to see what the expense would be associated with they're it. They're not even interested in hearing what the expense um, is going to be. Let's, well, maybe well maybe. offer that, I would say. Just offer or the right of entry to do this. What I was hoping we could do is get the folks that are up there that sort of have this subcommittee to maybe put together a document that gives them, that waives their expense, that they won't have any expense. Or rather than a document saying they will have no expense. Well, if they're willing to pay for it, you already said they are. Still then costing let's give them what they're asking for. You still got to get permission to go still on the property going and pay on your though. Yeah. He'll give it to you as long as we no, give them a he's not going to give the town permission to do anything, but he'll accept whatever's done. From what I understand. And is right. there a way to go around that? So you're not going to get, I don't like believe you're going to get these individuals to sign any way. Even authorize anything. Even if someone pays the bill. That, that's but my everybody's understanding. already crossing over the land anyway to get to their parcels, right? So they already so have a right of... We're going to walk. Right? I think we're going to move on in this one. They're not even there. Let's so maybe let follow up tomorrow on this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. I have an idea. Okay. Can we move on on this, Mike? Are you good with this? Yeah, before? that was the last article I had. So we'll have this on the May 6th. But um, I'll, I'll gotta call you tomorrow. I think I have an idea. We're going to move to the agenda on the capital planning committee. Sorry for us, we're running about six minutes late. <coughs> I'll let you know I lost my hearing a little bit, so you may have to a little bit tonight. And if I'm yelling and screaming, it's only because I can't get myself. It's like being on the side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. We'll try, I'll try, try to keep, keep it uh, brief. Um, the committee has, has completed its work, and the committee is comprised of uh, nine individuals, uh, uh, Diana Boutwell and, and Mike Conley representing the, the school department, um, uh, Buck Oberto and Liz Rourke representing the administration, two members from the <coughs> Board of Selectmen, uh, Mr. Prisco and Mr. Schultz, um, a uh, Citizen member Joe Foti and uh, Abby Hurlbutt and me representing the uh, the finance committee. So that's the the nine of us, and 
We've been working on this for several months. Liz has done most of the work, has, has pulled this thing together and uh, uh, put the report, the final report together. She's done, done a great job of it. Um, we, did, we, we stayed with our general formula of getting budget requests from the department heads, reviewing those, meeting with the department heads, going out and doing uh, a field survey where we thought it was appropriate to look at uh, re vehicles or property that was being um, recommended for replacement or, or an improvement. Uh, we ended up with uh, nine items that we thought we could recommend to be paid for from cash from the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund and another eight items that would uh, we're proposing that would be bonded uh, uh, for periods of anywhere from 10 to, to 20 years depending upon the the item we're also recommending that the the town acquire a new ambulance which will be paid for out of the ambulance fund and there is a request for funds from the, the three enterprise funds as well for, for some, some work to be done there. We'll go over that in a bit. Um, the totals for the school and municipal departments, uh, excluding a, a, uh, an alternate road request of $5 million, but if you take that out of it, uh, the requests were about five point. Two million dollars, um, more than we could we could uh, fit into this budget. Um, as I mentioned in the the memo that that accompanied this report, that's up considerably from from last year. It's about two times what it, what it was last year. What I thought we would do first is just to go into what it is we're recommending, answer questions on those, and then talk some more about some of the issues that I think the town is facing long term in, in keeping this, this program going and some exceptional items that are, that are being, being proposed. Uh, we can go down, down the list. The first item is, is a, a vehicle um, that, that we're, we're recommending um, as part of a, uh, a program to provide a vehicle for the town administrator. We're also recommending $600,000 in road construction of funds. Um, this is up from $300,000, which has traditionally been, been recommended. Um, we're also recommending to replace the turnout gear for the fire department. The turnout gear, there are two sets of gear. They've got a life of five years. One set has is, is met its five year, um, actually it's got a life of 10 years. Five years as the frontline equipment and five years as the backup equipment. The current backup equipment needs to be replaced. We move down the front line to the to the backup, and, we'll, and we will actually replace the uh, the new front line. So it's a it's a program that every every uh, five years we've got to replace one set of, of turnout gear. So this is the year for it, and it's about an eighty eight uh, eighty six thousand dollar item. Um, the next item is the computer replacement plan we have for the municipal departments. Uh, this is an ongoing item of keeping uh, the, the, the computer equipment refreshed for the, the municipal departments. It's $35,000. It would be used for laptops, desktops, servers, whatever, whatever the need is and, and as, as the IT director would, would, would deem appropriate to make sure that we're, we're current on the equipment that we have and that it is all, all working well. Uh, the next item is a, uh, to make some, interior, some uh, improvements to the interior of the DPW garage. This is the area, the lunchroom area and the restroom on the first floor that is, uh, that it's in, in pretty bad shape. We looked at it last year uh, didn't recommend it last year because we, we had run out of funds, but the, in looking at it this year, decided that this is something that, that needs to get done. It just is not, not a, uh, 
a good situation uh, for for their 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 uh, their lunchroom or the the, the restroom area. Um, school department education van replacement again. This is a, an ongoing uh, program of of keeping the the special needs vans um, current and and uh, and serviceable. The one that is being taken out of service is is, is pretty beat up. Uh, typically, the school department will take their oldest van, move it down, and use it for, for food service. Uh, this van is so bad that it's just gonna it's gonna pass by to the one that's current currently in use for food services in better shape. So this will be disposed of, and a new van will be put in place. It's important that we keep a fleet of these vans to take care of the needs of in-district um, uh, uh, transportation for special needs students. And, and uh, if, if uh, it is as part of the school department's program of, of providing educational services to special needs students, that um, this is one of the things we need to do or, or we're going to have some issues with, with perhaps some out of district placement, which is very costly. Um, the next item is a is, was a request of the police department. It's a simulator system. It's a it's, it's actually a piece of software um, that helps train the uh, the the the, uh, the the police department personnel in dealing with um, uh, situations that that require some special handling. It, it could be a, an attack or uh, of, of some sort or. or or some kind of, of, of terrorism issue. Uh, we had a demonstration of the product um, by, the, by the chief. Uh, there is currently a similar system that the, uh, the state police has that we have been able to use occasionally but can't get ready access to it. And um, we thought this would be beneficial as a, as a training item for the, for the police department. Uh, the next item is electronic system for the school department. This is uh, fire and intrusion alarms for the, uh, the hood and little schools. Again, we saw this as a safety issue and important that it be funded. Um, asbestos abatement. There are a number of buildings in town, the, the uh, town hall, Damon Tavern, and, and the senior center that have some asbestos in, in various areas that, that needs to be to be dealt with. So we, we lump them into one one project and uh, uh, ha are recommending that that, that be done. Uh, the uh, stormwater compliance. This is a requirement uh, that we, we need we need to do. Um, the document management system. For years, we've been talking about a document management system for the town. Um, what is proposed here essentially is the software and some conversion of material to the, the document management system. It is not at this point going back and digitizing all documents in the town. That will come over time. I expect we'll have a, another item on next year's request uh, that will deal with, with bringing, bringing current paper documents uh, into a system. Uh, the presentation made by the IT department was, was initially for the, in, the entire project, the software, and digitizing everything. After talking about it and, and, and considering the length of time it's going to take for this project <coughs> to be fully completed, uh, was the committee's feeling that um, we would be better off to start the project with getting the software, getting know how, know, knowing how to use it, and start using it on newly created documents, um, and then next year come back with, with something to, to deal with the, uh, uh, the longer term need of, 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 of digitizing uh, past documentation. Um, Lose my spot here. Um, I think I skipped one. Central Street um, uh, sidewalk design. In order to apply for a grant to do the sidewalks on Central Street, we have to have a design in hand. Uh, 
So all, that's all this is, and then it will put us in line for a grant, which we may or may not get, but we would have no chance of getting a grant unless we had had this design done. And so, and the, the uh, sidewalk is in, in two phases. This is the first phase. I'm not going to remember the, the bounding streets, but it's about halfway through Central Street, and then the next one would be, would be the balance it's of Spruce it. Spruce Road. I think it was Spruce down to yeah. 62. Um, the ambulance I mentioned, this is replacing Rescue Rescue 2 of $361,000, and this will be funded out of the, the ambulance reserve. Don, uh, yeah. uh, with respect to the ambulance, the, uh, uh, I thought I saw they were replacing a 10-year-old ambulance in the notes somewhere, uh, but the cost of buying a new ambulance usually, at the time, is usually a whole year. Yeah. So has that ambulance really gotten to be 10 years old? Or is it more like nine? Chief? Ask the expert. <laughs> right now that ambulance is nine years old. Okay. So by the time we get through that process, that year old. Is so yeah, it sounded to me like something got out of sync, that's all. Yeah. So that, that ambulance has seen a lot of wear and tear. It's currently yeah. uh, requiring a lot more maintenance. I'm not questioning replacing it so much as the age of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah it, it is the, the, I believe, the normal schedule of replacing the oldest ambulance and like we like the turnout gear moving the current top line down as the backup but it does take a year to build the ambulance don i have one other question regarding stormwater we talked about maybe transferring the cost of that because of federal regulations it's growing into attaching as part of maybe the water bill have we reached the point where we ought to be thinking about that now? I think that would be a question for the water department. Mark? Or Pat. So good evening. Um, it is something that a lot of communities do need to consider, you know, MS4. The EPA, as you know, renewed their MS4 permit. Um, we have been subject to that permit for many, many years prior, but they, they renewed the permit and they, they um, came up with a lot of more strict requirements for that. So what this, what this fund allows us to do is to gradually increase our database on what we have for infrastructure, analyze the infrastructure and make some improvements, spot improvements throughout the town. At some point, um, we may want to look at if we want to consider stormwater utility. Um, it's a considerable effort. Uh, I, I would imagine that um, it's going to require a lot of explanation and some workshops with, with uh, residents. Uh, so I think for now we should leave it as, it, my recommendation would be to leave it as a capital program. Maybe we have some money in the budget, obviously, that we use. Um, but we may want to consider, you know, expanding the utility component of that in the future. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next item on there is the the clapboard repairs to the library, and we've been talking about the work that needs to be done in the library for sev several years uh, through the, the the efforts of Julie and 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 Pat. Um, they have uh, proposed a uh, non wood product to be used on the lower part of the, the library and the historic commission has approved it so that we can make the repairs to the, the lower half of the, the library which currently now is just pine and it, will, we, and it rots out so we could replace all of that and the, and the pieces coming down on, on the side and have a fairly permanent fix to it There'll still be paintings that will be need, need to be done, but it's not going to rot out like the pine has done. So um, looking to preserve that very, very important town building um, it was, uh, 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 as I say, a, a, a lot of work on the part of uh, DPW and uh, to um, make the presentation to the, uh, the Historic Commission and to get, get the sign off on the use of something other than a uh, other than a wood product, so uh, we're, we're happy with this. We think this is a, uh, the, the building certainly needs to be preserved, but uh, we've been bothered by the cost of doing it and then the, the repeated cost of it over 
years if you didn't do a more permanent fix to it. So this, I think, takes care of that and does a fairly permanent fix to that, that part of the structure. Uh, in the DPW yard, um, there is a fabric building, if anybody's been down there, and this was, was a building that was used by the fire department when the, when the, the uh, fire department was being renovated several years ago, uh, and they used it to park the trucks, I think probably down, I think where the Honda barn was, in the big parking lot across the street from it, and then the DPW got it after that, and they've been keeping it together with, with, with masking tape and hope for a number of years. Well, the, uh, the elements have gotten to it, and it's, uh, it's, in, it's in tatters, uh, but they do need something to keep uh, some of their, their equipment out of the, the elements and uh, had proposed a, a building a metal building uh, to house the, the, this equipment, and we thought that made, made good sense. Uh, the next item is, this is going to be costly down the road, but this is the, the, the design um, for Upper Elm Street is the design construction plan uh, for the roadway and the, and the, the, uh, uh, and, and, uh, the and water um, and, and, and drainage in, on, in that road. Um, this will get us to the point where then we can consider doing the the, uh, the upgrades to the road, which, which will be an amount that we haven't determined at this point in time, but it's going to be going to be fairly expensive. Can you just explain what part of Elm Street that reflects? It is um, the short, short part from, from, from Elm out to Haverhill um, along the river. So it's from Haverhill Street down to Orchard Drive. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but it, it's, it's been a, a, a traditionally a, 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 an area that has needed work, um, but it, it, it's going to need some serious construction design to make sure that it's done right. It's not just going in and, 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 and paving a, a road. This, this is going to need some work. And this is the, the, the pre pre preparation work to get us to the point where it can be paved. Uh, but we've got to do it. And then in another season or two seasons, I expect that we'll be coming back and looking to have this included in the road program. We're going to talk more about the road program later. Um, the last two items are two vehicles, two uh, uh, dump trucks, um, a uh, F-350 and a uh, uh, 35,000 of uh, 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 gross weight dump truck, big truck. Um, part of the, 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 the program of keeping the DPW vehicles uh, up to date, uh, they, they run them pretty hard and they run them pretty long. Uh, part of our field trip was to, to look at the equipment and we thought that uh, these two, and, and there, was, there, was, there was another one that was, was, was requested, but we thought these two were the two that were in most <coughs> need of, of replacing. So they're big items, um, but um, uh, we need to keep the fleet up to date. So that, that takes us to um, about two and a half million dollars, including the ambulance. Um, Using cash for 540,000, bonding a million 627,000, and using the ambulance fund for the other 361,000 dollars. When we went through and did our analysis of the capital improvement stabilization fund and the town debt service, this was about as far as we thought that we could reasonably go in our recommendations. Uh, do we have the, that's the slides? There are a couple of slides I'm going to show you, and I'm going to come back to this because we need to talk about some more things on here, but um, just to, yeah. Um, well, if we can just focus on the top of this, really, the first dozen lines or so, and I'm sorry, I apologize that this thing is so hard to read, but there you go. Um, this is a look out over through 2025 of what we 
what we're recommending this year in the in the, in the first column, the 2020 column, um, which is is $539,000 in cash for items and and the million six twenty seven in bonding, uh, totaling the two million one sixty seven I just mentioned. There's probably there's a little over five hundred thousand. That's last year's chapter ninety number. I'm not sure what this year's is. I don't think it's it's terribly different from that. But whatever it is, it, it will be. But we're looking at, at o over two and a half million dollars in in capital projects, including including chapter ninety. Going out. Um, we tried to maximize to the extent we could the amount we're going to use from cash to pay for items that have got a five-year life. We didn't want to bond those, and, and that's been, been the, the, the position of, of the committee for the last several years. Under the bonding, the 10-year bonding um, this year includes $600,000 for roads. In 2021, that's also $600,000. And then starting in, in 2022 and going out, it increases by $25,000 a year. So that in 2025, we're talking about $700,000 in road money as compared to fiscal 19, which was $300,000. So we're talking about a lot more going into, into roads out of this fund. The impact of that is that it's got a, a pretty significant negative impact on the stabilization fund. If you could slide to the stabilization fund list. Um, and the reason is that this is 10-year bonding. So instead of having $300,000 that's being bonded for 10 years, we've got either six six and a quarter, 650 or 700,000 bonded for 10 years. So let's take a, a, a big bite out of the debt service. You remember that the debt service is, is limited by our agreement with the committee's agreement with the, with the select board to be no more than one point, when we're done, it will be no more than $1.1 million exclusive of what was done for the little school roof a couple of years ago. And at the, the very top of that, you can see the, where, where we are relative to that. We've balanced the, 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 uh, the debt service by using the stabilization fund. Um, what happens there, and the, very, the second last line on that, on the stabilization fund, where it says transfer to debt service, um, as we move out, we're, we're using some of the stabilization fund to maintain the debt service at that $1.1 million. And that's growing. And the reason it's growing is that the 10-year bonding on roads is growing in an amount from, as I say, from $300,000 in fiscal 19 to $700,000 in, in 2025 which says that in 2025, we, we, we have to take over $400,000 out of the stabilization fund to maintain the $1.1 million cap on, on uh, borrowing. What we're going to borrow, the 700000 in 2025, really won't hit until starting in 2026. So if you follow that projection out a couple of more years, you can, you you, you can see that in 2020, we, we're starting with about $920,000. We're going to end the year with about a million, a little over a million. It stays around that, grows a bit, and then starts going down. But by um, 2025, we're down under $800,000. And if you followed out the progression of the paying the debt service on the expanded road work, which I think we need to do, this fund would be exhausted probably in two more years after that. We don't, we'd, there'd be nothing left, okay? Not to say we shouldn't be doing the, the work, but it's, it's gonna leave this fund at a, at a point where, there, there, as I say, there is, there is no fund and we will lose our safety net. Um, committee's recommendations to the, to the select board is, is to do one or two or a combination of things, one, 
would be to raise the one point one million dollar cap to something higher than that to accommodate the or recognize that the debt service from what we're we're recommending and what we, we think we need to be doing is is going to be higher or to increase the amount of money that the town puts into the stabilization fund each year Starting in, in 2021, that will be a steady state of $600,000 a year. Um, if you look in the, the, the 2024 column, is 150 and 250 in, in June and another 200 in, in October under the, the old schedule we have. That, that's the $600,000. It really doesn't go into the fund and come out, but for purposes of, of, of demonstrating how this thing works, and how the funding for the the items that are being proposed works we're showing it as it's going in and back out of the fund it, it doesn't necessarily do that but there is a six hundred thousand dollar commitment that the town has made in previous years to the capital stabilization fund that would need to change so i say it's either or or a combination of, of raising the cap the $1.1 million cap or putting more money into the, the, uh, the stabilization fund. We can, oh. yeah. Have we ever looked at it as, what if we paid down a, a big chunk of debt? What, would that have a positive effect, negative effect, no effect? Well, if you paid down a big chunk, chunk of debt, then it would free up, free up yeah. debt service because if you slide up to the middle of this list, uh, keep going a little bit more a little bit more okay right there the the line that reads pre fiscal 2020 debt service the 933,000 842,000 and so forth going from from left to right that represents what is on the books right now for debt service that we things that we've already committed to and what the, the debt service, the principal and interest of that, will be over that period of time. So to answer your question, Mike, to the extent that you do pay something off, you would reduce that line. But I mean, you're going to be using whatever, whatever funds you're using to do it. I mean, it could be done, you could do it that way, you could increase the cap, or you could put more money into um, the current year. But any of those things would work. You're, you're, you're absolutely right, so if you cut Half a million dollars out, then you'd have you'd have that that available. Yes, Liz. Is wrong. I did uh, speak to our financial advisor, Hilltop Securities, uh, last week in regards to this issue. It would depend on how much we did, you know, um, and what items we chose to pay down. And when I say what items, it be I mean the length of borrowing. So if we chose an item that has a 30-year uh, borrowing term that we have out there and has 25 years remaining, it may not have a huge impact. Right. Um, as if we chose an item that has 300,000 remaining that we borrowed for 10 years. Do you understand? Because you know we were paying a greater uh, principal and interest annually for the 10-year uh, item than the 25-year item. So the reason I bring this up is because, you know, I'm not a believer in suffering in silence, okay? But we've done a lot of good things, but our roads have got, a, got away from us, and we know that. Going through, sitting on the CIPC this year, I've seen it myself. Mr. Bauer has come in, his team, they've done a great job presenting the conditions of our roads, and they're trending negative, not positive. They're not even trending to a neutral. They're trending worse. We have to do something different to get ahead of it, or it's going to get even more expensive, as Mr. Howard explained to us. So, hence why you see on the other previous chat where we're requesting some additional funds from free cash to sort of get a little bit ahead of it. But I, my belief is that we did the right things. We went up, we sold the JT Berry money, and I'm not running away to say, hey, you know, spend all of it. We put $15 million of away, and that was the right thing to do. And we're getting an investment from that. But we also put away $4 million. And I do believe that this is a perfect opportunity to consider using it to pay down debt, to free up some availability for you and your team for next year and the years following. You know, hit the little bit of a reset button and, it'll, and allow us to add more money towards Chapter 90 or to, towards the roads so we can get ahead of this. 
and, and I really do believe it needs to be discussed. The next board needs to take this one on. That's going to be my recommendation. So. Okay. All right, why don't we... We did a good job. We, we earned the money. We got the money. And guess what? It takes it away from the taxpayers a little bit, too. It, does, it doesn't have an effect on that. Right? If we can pay down some of it, it will help. So that's just my own personal opinion. Well, my suggest but the suggestion would also... Would there be an expectation to bond more money to cover more roads? So it, you're still going to, the taxpayers are still going to pay for it. You're just going to be able to tackle the, the project on a more timely basis and, and do more roads sooner rather than later and not allow for greater deterioration and additional costs to do it. So, I mean, we're not going to save the taxpayers any money. Well, I, I other than we're going to be able, to, other than we're going to be able to get ahead of it a little bit more than we are right now, okay. I think my spin on it, and you can call it <laughs> spin, is it does save because we're doing it sooner, and the longer we wait, we know the construction costs go up every year. And all I'm trying to do is to give the CIPC the ability to continue to keep doing the work they're doing within the parameters that were set by the board. And sometimes you got to hit the reset button to give them that margin to work within again. That's my thought on this, and maybe. Mr. Well, I think uh, the committee under the direction of Dawn put this plan together a few years ago and I, I'd suggest that we ask that committee to come back with a, a plan that sort of meets some of our needs going forward and how we might best address them and uh, what it would require to put and keep a plan in action so we don't go overboard at the same time get some of the tasks like the roads which I think everybody believes we ought to be doing something about sooner than later thank you Mr. 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 yeah and I'm gonna be a broken record like I've said this before but I think we are gonna save the taxpayers money in the sense that if we can get to roads when they're still in the refurbishing stage versus when they get to the reclamation stage the cost is uh, uh, I believe it's four or five times difference. Kirk, Pat, Kirk, if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's four or five times difference if you stay on top of it. So if we can get to more of them now before they get to the point with a reclamation, which for the public at home means just you got to tear them apart and start anew, you're going to save the taxpayers a lot of money. You know, this program does need a jump start. There's no doubt about it. The bottom line is, you know, we, we went out and we achieved more on the JT Berry funds than we thought. We did the right thing. We've invested for the future. We've got it set aside for the folks that are working there the wastewater and the water, and hopefully it'll stay there until we get the point to get that wastewater down. But we also have that other $4 million chunk that's there. And if we're suffering, we should think about using it. This is the time, without trying to put it on the backs of a tax rate or anything else. The, the only thing that, that I would caution there, and, and, and I, I, I brought it up in, in our meetings as well, is that all the best intentions in the world are only intentions if we don't have the capacity the physical capacity, not the financial capacity, yeah. but the physical pa capacity to get it done, yeah. um, which le leads into to the, to the next the next part of this on the roads. As I said, we we were looking at raising this from 300 to 600, plus the 500 from from chapter 90 or a million one. Uh, the DPW from Pat. Uh, feels very confident that they could adequately spend or efficiently spend a million and a half dollars and have identified the roads that they would do if they had a million and a half worth versus a million one. Uh, the plan is in is to try to do um, roads within a neighborhood and they will move through the town over, over time doing them and it just is the the staging cost of the the contractor to do it is minimized because you're you're in one place and you can do a group of roads rather than moving them all over to all, all over town but having a plan so that it is real clear what roads are going to be done this year next year the year after that and so forth um, with the caveat that things happen you know so there is a an, a, an issue you didn't plan on coming up comes up and throws everything off kilter for a year, but then we get back on. We don't forget that we had promised to do certain roads. But they're fairly confident that they could do a million and a half dollars worth of, of construction this season 
which would be some reclamation, some crack sealing, and everything in between. There isn't, as, as we've just looked at, there isn't enough money in the stabilization and the debt, the, the, the capital improvement stabilization fund to do it without taking a lot of other things off the table. And roads is only one of the issues we have in the town. Uh, other buildings need, need, need work. Vehicles need to be constantly replaced. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of things that we need to do. So we can't concentrate it only on one element of, the, of town assets, as, as important as it is. So the committee isn't recommending that we add another $400,000, take $400,000 more in cash from the, the stabilization fund and either deplete that more or to not do other things. Uh, there was a motion that was made to, to, to approve the other $400,000 provided funding could be found to do it and that, that funding um, wasn't specified but it was, it was uh, surmised to be either from free cash or from the, the uh, proceeds from sale, previous sales of town owned land take that for, for, for what it is, but I mean, it's, it's in all likelihood we're, we're talking about, about the Pulte property, um, but it could be others. Um, we thought that was, it was, was fine as long as DPW could do it, and they were very confident that they could do it, and I said that's, then in my, my, my hesitation was, was in, in, in expecting too much of them. They think they can do it. I'm perfectly comfortable saying, Let, let's do it, because it makes sense to be doing the adjacent area to what the, to where they're working at this time, and and get something completed. So that's the four hundred thousand dollars in roadway restoration, which is which is um, an additional recommendation that's going to have to come from funds other than this the stabilization fund. I yes. Just want to add a little to that. Yep. So this is the Anthony Road, Peter Road area, and so the plan that was presented to us included all the roads for Peter Road because we didn't have enough money, right? And so this money allowed, so the contractor would have finished that area and left Peter Road alone and then next construction year, have to go all the way back to that area and just do Peter Road. And we were, we were trying to get some efficiencies here to maximize the dollars. So rather than have them leave, we wanted to add the extra $400,000 and complete it while they're there and get that whole section that whole area now completed, which will help us now free up more space to do other roads and other areas next year. And that's what would be the goal of trying to find some latitude in this capital fund so when um, Mr. Powell goes out to bid or he starts looking at areas, he doesn't have to bring a contractor out and leave one road left. You know, we want to gain some efficiencies by giving some flexibility. If we can add that one road, and that's what we try to do here, I think it gives him a lot more efficiency you pay for it a lot less this year than you will next year. So that's a little more background. You may want to add more unless I cash it. Okay? That's the concept of why we, I made the motion, it got seconded, and I think we only had one vote against it, which you based on the dead, It, the it, had, you, and it was CL not, it was on. not on, on, on this part of it. It was the way the vote was constructed that gave me an issue. But anyway, I've gone beyond that. I think, I think this is something we, sh we should be doing. Uh, there was another additional item, um, the computer devices. We've been funding um, the, the school department has, has put a, a program in place so that, that the children in the seventh grade two years ago all got computer devices. They will keep that, it's like their Chromebooks, I believe. They will keep them through to their, they graduate from high school. Same, same device, and it's worked out well so far. The kids have taken good care of them. They don't take them home in the summer, but they, they've been taking good care of the equipment. The seventh, the, this year the seventh grade, grade got it again, so the seventh and the eighth then had the Chromebooks. There was a, a a request on the on the, in the from the schools for this year's uh, installment of that. Prior to that happening, the schools uh, contacted Representative Jones, um, and he was able to secure for them seventy-five thousand dollars 
And with that $75,000, they spent, and you guys can correct me if the numbers wrong, 60 of it for computer devices for the current ninth grade. So the seventh, eighth, and ninth had them. Some on the committee said, well, we get so many things to do this year. Um, we've taken care of the computer devices installment for this year through, by not, but not using any of the capital money, but it's been done because the money came from somewhere else. Um, the superintendent has, has requested again for another grant from the state for the current year, and that's in, in the works. What some of us on the committee only found out recently was that the Representative Jones' ability to get the first grant for us, and in all likelihood the ability, if he can get the second one, and that's not assured, um, the fact that we've been sponsoring this program for the last two years played a big role in it. He was able to convince his, his, uh, his uh, uh, counterparts in the, in the House that uh, the, the town was behind this and, and doing the program, and this would just move the, the program forward. Um, as I say, many of us weren't, weren't aware of that. This item, when we did our ranking, fell fairly far down on the ranking, ranking sheet. There were a couple of other, about three or four other items that we would have been, would have used cash for um, that were ahead of it. Um, when we learned of the, the tie-in to the, the grant tied back to the town funding, again, a motion was made or was accompanied the, the original motion on the, the road work to add this to the, the same uh, program so that this would be, again, funded out of a yet, yet to be named uh, source. Um, and that passed the committee as well. So that's why that's there. Um, and that was the recommendation of, of the committee. So if there is funding for it, then both of those items uh, would be added to this year's capital program. Michael Gilbert. Through you, Mr. Chair, and I, I don't have to, I don't want to speak for the finance director, but we have looked at the sources of available funds, and as I presented in the uh, discussion before, we believe that we have sufficient free cash uh, on hand to fund both of those projects for a total of 460000 extra dollars in cash uh, investment. So we would not be touching the uh, so-called sale of town land uh, funding for these projects at this time. So it's the committee's recommendation to do it if, if there was funding and if there it looks like there is funding. So the committee's recommendation is that we go ahead with these two items. Uh, the bottom part of the sheet of the items that didn't make the cut, uh, all important and um, we need to uh, take them up next year when we're, when we're looking at the fiscal 21 and fiscal 22 and fiscal 23 requests. Uh, these items have to be brought back into into the into consideration because um, they're all worthy of of, um, of, of of consideration and they and as they said they were considered it's just that you got you got to draw a line someplace you, you can't do do everything there's only so much money you can spend so uh, to your your point mr. Prisco that you know that this if there was more money we would have done more things Yep. So that's the, the, the recommendation um, from the committee, and uh, I won't go through each of those. You can read them yourself, and uh, they're, they're, I think, pretty self-explanatory what the, the items are, but if, if you they're have questions. In, they're all in the share file with the details that yep. will support each one of the line items. Unless anybody else on the committee has got anything to say? <coughs> Liz? I don't know who else is here. Nobody else. Michael. Michael. Yeah. I'm sorry. We do have more people from the committee. Uh, I, I just the TA was, and the two selectmen. I, I know that I, I say it every year, but through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, as you can see, Mr. Kelleher knows this information in and out, and you and I both sat with Mr. Schultz and the folks here at the table with you, Don. And, um, you know, I, I know that Liz and I, we, we rely on you 
like um, the many full-time employees we have here in Town Hall, and we know you do so for free. So thank you so much for your efforts, um, you know, for what is a six-plus month process every year. So I, I thank you for your efforts. It's greatly appreciated. A lot appreciated. of it goes to Liz, who she, she does the heavy lifting. Yeah, I just want to say, I've been on CIPC for two years now, and it's been an absolute pleasure. It's You really see how the town works as far as these projects, and again, not to throw bouquets your way over there, Mr. Keller, but you do a yeoman's job and uh, really guide the committee, and we, I thank you immensely. Do I get a raise? Work. You get double your salary. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you do a great job, and thank you. Thank you. This is my first year. I've been here nine years. It's the first year I've done CIPC, and I learned a lot. And it is an amazing process. And I got to see the process that this board put in place four years ago, five years ago? Six. Six years ago? Yeah. And it's a process. It's, we follow the procedure, we stick to it, and it works. And I hope that we continue to do it and then continue to improve on it. But Don, really under your leadership, it's how it really gets done. It's brought you as well and your staff. I know people don't realize how many nights uh, the spreadsheets are being built and put together. So I want to thank you all for the wonderful presentation. And hopefully this will get supported as we go through town meeting. Any board members, any questions, concerns? This is the time and the place. No, other than, you know, I've had the, uh, I don't know, you lose, use the term loosely, the pleasure of serving, <laughs> <laughs> serving on the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. It is, uh, it, it's a lot of work, a lot of effort put into it. And uh, again, uh, your efforts don't go underappreciated here anyway. And it's to you too. Um, again, I, I was a little bit concerned with uh, the use of Pulte money uh, for this, in this fashion maybe, just you know, spending the cash. I mean, I wouldn't mind taking a look at uh, the possibility of using some of that as leverage for borrowing, but the earnings could help offset, and you'd still retain some of the principal. But that's uh, apparently based upon the administration's recommendations. That's a discussion for another day. So uh, I have no problem in supporting the uh, recommendations of the of the committee and applaud all your efforts that you put into it. And again, it's not easy to prioritize these things, as you said, Mr. Keller. Everything is needed. You know, there isn't anything on here that's that's not needed. So. But the future boards have, you know, a lot to work on after you get through John, June town meeting. You start to prepare for next year. You have a lot of decisions to make. And, you know, again, we have a resource that we've all went up and achieved. We can use it wisely. This may be one of those areas because you can only use two things with that money, right? You pay down debt or buy capital. And, and this is what we're talking about. So I leave it at that. But, yes, for this year, we don't need to touch that money. We have the opportunity as you you have plenty of free cash to go ahead and allocate to these items, and I hope it's supported. And just one last thing on the road, just so the public knows, I think we touched on it, but just to make it clear, we will have a plan in place so the public will be able to see what roads are being targeted and in what fiscal year they should be done. Again, Friday, we don't have any natural disasters or anything happen that puts us off schedule, but just want the folks out there to know that, you know, help is coming with the roads. Yeah. Not that this is an excuse, but remember, over in the Lawrence area and or there's still there's a lot of impacts to their roads and there's gonna be a lot of construction going on over there. We have to compete with that. That's one of the challenges that our DPW director is faced with is trying to get the people to do the work here in town so uh, we can support this and get done early and get them out there so we can get these bids done. Uh, and sort of compete with that what's going on over in Lawrence. You can, you can tell they're redoing all those roads now and uh, they have a gas company, it's a priority. You, you know, I know it's important to the government too that we get they get their roads settled over there in Lawrence and Andover, but we still have to continue to do our work. So if we can give the DPW director the tools he needs to compete and get these bids done, I think we'll be we'll be able to continue to keep our roads getting better. Any other questions, but, Michael? Just a, a note that we have our first resident who's come forward to support one of the projects. Mr. Brandano is here. Speak up. We have a, a resident who, who's here to support one of the projects, the uh, Upper Elm Street uh, project, Mr. Stephen Brandano, who is uh, in the audience. Can prove that he's a resident anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Brandano, he, he's been diligent in his correspondence with, I think, both you and I in support of the project, and uh, yeah, thank you for coming out tonight. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I appreciate being recognized, and thank you for um, considering this project. I think it's uh, a project that's way overdue. Uh, a lot of us travel that road every single day. It's uh, oh, sorry. Just get the folks at home can't hear you. Stay, just state your name. Steve Brandano, a resident uh, Five Hidden Pond Lane, North Reading. 
Um, it's just a, it's a project that I've supported along with my neighbors on Duane on Upper Elm Street as well as Hidden Pond Lane. It's a, it's a road we travel quite often. Uh, last 24 years, I've been traveling it almost every single day. Uh, I know that uh, the, the town manager Michael uh, also travels it as well, and it's just a, in very very bad disrepair. It's been tried to be patched many times over. It needs to be done right. It needs to be cleaned up. It needs to be dug out. Water has to, water ha uh, mains have to be. Uh, placed or uh, repaired in, in that area, uh, new sand, to, all, it needs to be done correctly and I appreciate the, the board and the committee recommending this project get done. I think uh, this, all this is a big step. This is definitely a huge step to get there. Right. Thank you. With that, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the fiscal year 2020 capital expenditures as recommended by the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Minipelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. You're welcome. If your job is done, you can pick up your check at the desk. Okay, good. good. <laughs> can do right. You can stay, though. <laughs> <laughs> Next, what do you want to take next? Do you want to take the FY 2020 to the expense plan? I, just, I believe we have the building permit um, fee uh, reviewing the changes in the building permits right before that, Mr. Chair. Do I have that right? What did you say? Number the, nine. Uh, building permit fees. Yes, it's up to you. Uh, the, so the building inspector is here this evening. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, so if we wouldn't sure. mind taking that up. Absolutely. Um, so the board does have in its packet a, uh, a report from the building inspector relative to his recommendation and his intention, uh, because it is under his authority to set the fees. We thought we would provide the board the courtesy of reviewing those fees. We did indicate during his budget hearing a few weeks ago that uh, we were looking at an increase. Um, so what I'd like to do is just maybe briefly review um, what he has provided here, and then. Um, you know, he's put quite a bit of research into it. Chief, uh, excuse me, Chief, Bill, uh, to the Building Inspector, Mr. Newell, are you prepared to just kind of briefly go through the exercise that you did and uh, describe the, uh, the recommendation? Which you're welcome to set up here at the oh, microphone. Oh, yes. I'm happy to do that if you want to answer the questions. How about that? So can I ask a question while... Can I just ask a question while he's sitting down? Who determines the fees and approves the fees? So we believe through the review of uh, the statutes that we've adopted that it would be the department uh, that, that has oversight. So it would be the building inspector who would set those fees. He so, sets bo them. so the board's not being asked to approve it. Um, we're simply providing an overview uh, and advising the board that we are making the change. And it would be for a, a time uh, effective July 1st, 2019. So there's still some time before they would go into effect. Correct. So the board doesn't have the authority to that set That is our understanding. It's with the department. Correct. As, as long as we maintain competitive with, with, with other communities in which in which we are at this point in time. Uh, we, we are not at this point in time. Once we increase our fees, we will be competitive. Very good. The floor, over to you if you could just announce for the folks. Uh, sure. So it's uh, page 61. 61. Jerry Noel, Building Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Noel. Please. I'm hoping we're looking at the same page I'm looking at here, which yes, is... Yes, so page 61, it's a memorandum from you dated March 19th, 2019. Fantastic. Okay, what, what I proposed was, to, was, was for the building fees, <coughs> for our permit fees, have an increase in 11 or 12 years. Um, and we want to align these with basically other, uh, other costs with other communities. Um, and I base this on several factors. The length of time it takes to review applications, required documentation and notification to the applicants <clears throat> for omitted requirements, the time spent on plans, review relative to size and complexity of the project, construction plans, resubmittals due to plan rejection, and new plan review. Investigate the value of the proposed work, ensure that is not underestimated. The proposed project may be subjected to field inspections prior to approving a permit. Review of narrative or submittal of the detail that may outline changes made to the project and identify them at time of inspection. This is very complex and takes a sufficient amount of time. Uh, inspections that may fail with additional inspections required. All that was taken into consideration when I was basically going over where we should be with our fees. 
Um, and the building department performs an average of roughly 4.5 inspections per permit. That doesn't mean just a window gets 4.5 inspections. It's basically new construction all the way to all the way to that one window or that roof. Uh, new construction usually takes anywhere from seven to as many as nine inspections. So, um, so what I did is I, I performed uh, an evaluation of our neighbor, a survey, I should say, uh, which Andover, Middleton, Reading, and Wilmington. And I received the following results. The last fee increase for Andover was plumbing and gas, which is in 2012. Their electrical fees were increased in 2015. Their permit fees have not increased since 2003. The structure for the application process is to first pay a non-refundable application fee of $25. Their cost per thousand is $13, with a minimum fee for residential at 25 and commercial 25. Just to kind of put that into per perspective, we don't have an application fee, and our cost per thousand is $10. So you can see a, a huge, a considerable difference right there. Mm -hmm. um, the electrical and plumbing and gas are roughly 50% higher. This collectively has Andover roughly 40% higher than what the town of North Reading currently is. Middleton performed a fee increase for all disciplines in 2016. They, they do not have any, any application fees. They charge $11 per 1,000 for residential and 13,000 for commercial. Their minimum fees are $50, residential, $75, uh, 75 for commercial. Their electrical, plumbing, and gas are roughly 40% higher than North Reading. 47% uh, higher, I don't know if I said 40, excuse me. This collectively has Middleton roughly 32% higher than North Reading. Reading performed their last fee increase in 2006, which is much further than, than us. Even though their last fee increase was 13 years ago, their permit fees are still higher than North Reading. Their cost per 1,000 is $11 for residential and 12 for commercial. After speaking with the building commissioner, Mark Dupel, he explained, I explained the reason for my call, and he's, he's interested in using the same format and using the same type of increases how I basically formulated them. And that was in Reading. Uh, their electrical and their plumbing and gas are roughly 55% higher. Um, this collectively has Reading 32% higher than our cost. Wilmington, their last fee increase was roughly 20 years ago is what the commissioner conveyed. They have a non-refundable application fee of $50 and 100 for commercial. Their electrical plumbing and gas fees are equal to North Reading's. But collectively their fees are 24% higher than North Reading partially due to the application fees. So looking at all the above data and the attached charts, um, you will note that the neighboring towns are roughly 32% greater than North Reading permit fees. The permit fee in increase I am proposing is roughly 33% higher than the current rate, um, which I have attached. A pro I don't know if you have the attached proposal as well. Yeah, we have it, yep. Um, so fiscal year 2018, the building department drew in from permit fees a total of $410,775. If this 33% was in effect at that point in time, we would have, we would have had an additional $135,556, which would have been a grand total of $546,000. So it just goes to show you how much more the town could be collecting in fees through that process. But I, you know, I think that it's really important to, to state that it's not just to collect the fees, to collect the money, to have the money. It's to collect the fees to cover the cost. To cover the cost. cost Correct. have increased significantly over the last 11 and 12 years. And I think that's what's really important here. It's not just out to raise fees because no. we can't. We don't want to just raise fees because no. of that. We want to raise fees to, to, for, because of the level of service. We want to be able to yeah. continue to provide a quality level of service. And uh, right now, I, I don't see myself in another six months being able to do that. No. I think you did a great job in the summary. I don't know if the board yeah. needs any more on it. <clears throat> any more just questions? No. I, w I would agree with that. I don't. It does. I think you did a nice job doing a comparison, but it doesn't really matter to me what the other communities are charging. If it correlates to providing more, 
administrative efficiencies for you and getting people faster inspections and getting people their permits more quickly, right. then that would be the basis for if, if this new fees help you do that, then that would be the reason why we would we would if be it allows us to invest in more resources for you in the form of maybe positions or something in the future, this will also help with that too. Great. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Yeah, I mean, this is what I would like to see. I mean, if there's no doubt that there's uh, a need to, you know, reevaluate our, our fee structure, and I don't think what's being proposed here is unreasonable. But that being said, I think it's important for this board and the administration to make the commitment to spend those resources to get the additional help in order right. to get the inspections done on a more timely basis, right. in order to meet the needs of the public out there in order to get their projects up and going and running. And again, we'll not overtaxing, you know, uh, one particular individual or you know, one particular staff person in the, in the office. You know, what we really need is some bodies out there. And yeah. I think uh, it's not unreasonable to expect the, uh, the fee structure to help, if not entirely, cover the costs associated with that. And I think we've fallen behind. And I think right now in the Inspectional Services Department and the Health Department, we need additional resources now with what, everything that's going right. on. And I guess that's discussion for a little bit later on. You know, what are we going to do in the current fiscal year in order to meet the current demands for this uh, current building season? Because I know we're falling behind, and right. it's through no fault of the effort that's being put in here by Mr. Noel and, and the rest of the uh, Special Services Department. So uh, we need to cover the costs, and uh, and I don't think these fees are or outlandish or outrageous. And, and I, I appreciate the, the comparative study, too, because, you know, I, I've heard it before. Oh, North Reading fees are through the roof, and other towns are so much cheaper, and it isn't so. So um, for that, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So at least I have a retort you know, when someone <laughs> makes, a, makes a statement. Um, so I think it's important, and I think we need to um, keep up with the times and probably do this on a more regular basis. But again, I want to make sure that the commitment is made by the administration and the board here that the resources go to where, mm -hmm. where the fees are being raised. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. rather than just shortchanging, you know, the um, the projects out there and the uh, the developers out there and holding them up. I mean, we need to provide the resources if they're going to be paying for the services. So we're going to require them to pay for the services and anticipate we'll be able to deliver. Right. We have to deliver. Mr. Gobert. So uh, I will speak to that, obviously, in the next uh, two agenda items for, uh, from now. Uh, I will note, though, that uh, we are not updating the revenue plan for fiscal year 2020 to reflect this increase. We're sort of front funding that now out of the operating budget. And as we evaluate the performance, we believe that this increase will allow us to sustain the staffing that we're recommending beyond fiscal year 2020. If we were going to do that, or when you go to do this, what would be the effective date? I would say July 1st, 2019. <clears throat> Is there no, no reason why it's so long? Uh, we want to give the public notice. Give the I think public more than notice. anything, that, I understand. that was the idea. I understand, but it, all right, all right, it's fine. Yeah, the, if the board has a suggestion to no. present this sooner, first is fine. I, mean, it's I, not I don't that know. Far that, I don't know that the, the, the. I mean, it, it's nice to give notice, but I mean, the cost of the fees are going to be the cost of the fees for the permits, yeah. regardless. It's not going to stop any project, you know, on a cost per thousand basis. Uh, and again, the revenue streams that, that's needed to uh, currently sustain what we have and what's going to be proposed, I assume, uh, is immediate. So. I think 30-day notice is fine, but if you, you've, again, I don't get a vote in this, but I, don't, I just don't, I think we can do a lot of, um, we can get the information out, right? We can get, the, get it out there. We're, we're better at it today than we ever have been. So, you know, waiting two, two and a half months, We'll, we'll look maybe after this meeting with the building inspector to determine you know what we need to update, what forms need to be updated, and yep. see what the turnaround is. I, I'm wondering if maybe you know a June 1st effective yep. date could be done or something like that. Okay, we'll make that known at the next meeting. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming in this evening. Thank you. All right. Next to review the FY 2020 revenue plan and expense. I Mr. want to turn it over to Mr. Caburo. Thank you. I'll just offer a brief introduction, which is that. Since our last uh, board meeting a few weeks ago, we have had uh, multiple financial planning team meetings um, and have identified uh, what we believe to be um, the very close to final revenue and expense plan for fiscal year 2020. Um, I do want to recognize the con contributions of the financial planning team members, including Mr. Buckley, who's here this evening. Thank you for your time. Um, 
we've made some adjustments, and I've talked, I think, with a number of the board mem members, uh, at least informally, relative to what those adjustments are, but I'll turn it over to the finance director to, um, to review that. Um, we have some notes that we can review, and I would point out that this, uh, this document that will be reviewed uh, is in the meeting packet, um, if you want to zoom in on it. Uh, it immediately follows the uh, permit fee presentation that you just saw, which means if you look to page 68 of your packet, you should be able to zoom right in and look at the uh, revenue plan for fiscal year 2020, revenue and expense plan for fiscal year 2020. Thank you. Mr. Masseri? Michael, there's some uh, yellow mark here. in there intentionally? Yes, uh, so those uh, I believe are all the areas of note where changes have occurred from the last review we had with the board, but the finance director will explain that. So, good evening. Good evening. Quickly, I'm going to um, do a quick snapshot of the revenue plan as we do annually. Then I will go into detail to the updated um, revenue plan that as uh, the town administrator mentioned is in the meeting packet. So this is um, high level and then we will get into the, the changes and the highlighted areas um, uh, on the revenue plan. Some of the areas that have been updated um, from FY19 to FY20 is one that was recommended to be um, singled out, and you can see that is the new addition of 104 Little Road New Growth, which is listed um, just be below New Growth. So for FY19, we have the certified amount of New Growth of 753. Uh, thousand, and then we have the estimated new growth um, for FY20 of 289,000, and the new growth that we estimate for 104 Little Road, Martin's Landing, Fulte property, 685,000. We have all of our other categories that are typical annually, um, the debt exclusions, uh, state aid unrestricted general government aid, state aid chapter 70. Uh, we have a reimbursement that we receive for a past um, what was MSBA project. And then we have our local receipts, which includes license and permits, motor vehicle excise, um, you know, meals tax, all of our, our local receipts. Other financing sources you'll note uh, between FY19 and FY20 is a significant decrease, and the reason for that is the direct allocations, which we will see on the revenue plan in just a moment. Yes? Does the Chapter 70 number you have in there represent the most recent numbers from the state? So the Chapter 70 number that is listed here is according to the governor's budget. It is not to the newly released numbers that came out <coughs> last week. Those have been approved, yeah. Correct. Okay. How far apart were the, uh, the legislative there was a numbers? Slight, there was a slight increase. Yeah. Um, it, it was very minimal. It really was not, you know, large for, for our town. Okay. And then we get down to the budget, where we have the fixed cost breakout. And again, you'll note in this area, um, FY20 is uh, reduced greatly, and that's due to the direct offsets of fixed cost expenses to the municipal side as well as the school side, and we'll see those in detail on the revenue plan in just a moment. So I just want to point out for the for everyone notification, it's obviously you see we broke the 104 low road new growth out separately so people can see it, and just to give you a kind of a perspective on what that means, that that's almost almost not a full third of the revenue that's potentially going to be coming in based on our projections it's not a full third but it's pretty close but you can figure you know let's just call that somewhere probably you know, it's probably missing about another hundred grand but after that you know you're about a third way there so you know what you have coming in, in the future very near future yes do we know how many housing units are coming in this fiscal year what do you uh, I can't buildings, right? say because they're 
I believe they're ahead of schedule. Yeah. And I don't want, but it's going to be at least 50. So it's probably two different buildings. Yeah. They they're already at one done, and yeah. they have another one, and I believe they're going to try to shoot for a third. I'm sure you did this for us last year. I just don't remember. Was that a pretty similar breakdown for new growth last year? There was a big chunk of it that related to that. It was a much smaller for much. the new, so for 104 Little Road piece of the certified new growth of 753 was a much smaller um, chunk of it uh, for the reason that it was only the land value that was represented as, as new growth. So that, that makes a difference. Thank you. Anyone, any questions on this slide? Good. We'll move on to the revenue plan. Just Please. area was summarized on the previous slide. You can see that new growth is broken out here and totals 975,000. I think you could zoom in a little bit, right? Sure. Maybe at the bottom right hand corner of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> part of the revenue plan, not wanting to incorporate that as part of our revenue plan because it was one time sort Correct. of shifting of shifting around of funds. Yes, um, and I, I can let the town administrator uh, speak to the logic behind it, but it, whether we budget for it or not, it's general fund revenue. It's it, Whether it's invested in a CD or it's not, it's still going to earn some investment income, and that investment income either gets budgeted as a local receipt or, um, you know, would just generate free cash because it is a general fund revenue source. So uh, just like all of our other uh, cash that is available besides for special cash, uh, whether it's a stabilization fund, that type of thing, that has to be designated to the stabilization fund. But the sale of town on land is um, interest income is gener a general fund revenue. So that isn't restricted to only for capital purposes. Not the interest, In interest income. Not the interest income, correct. Okay. Mr. Gilboro? I, I would just add that you know, my belief was that, and, and it was you know, a reaction to an, uh, feedback from a number of folks, including the members of the board, that you know, w we should be looking to be phasing away from this. And I think that was ultimately the intention when it was recommended initially. You know, we are seeing the new growth, and I know I stepped out of the room, but you see that we are seeing new growth directly tied to Polte, and as that continues to happen, at some point there'll be a swing point where we, we can move away from the relying on the interest income. 
ultimately the interest income will be there as long as we haven't spent the money and I think you know, you know at some point the intention is that the money would be expended whether it be to pay down existing debt or for infrastructure investment or other capital investment so uh, you know this phasing is a it, it's a plan but like anything it's something that we could revisit at any point in time you know if we get to next year and it looks like we're still a number of years out from expending that because we're committed to the wastewater we're not ready to spend the funding then we may be able to prolong that phasing out uh, it just depends upon what our intentions are but I'm confident in this plan that, you know, it's responsible. Um, yeah. so. And just to add a little bit more to it is, you know, we just felt that the feedback was important that we received the last time we had this discussion. But we were way down the road a little bit with this revenue and expense plan. So we didn't want to be disrespectful and disregarded at all. So mm -hmm. this was sort of our, our best approach to try to start the process. <coughs> uh, so we hope that's acceptable to you. Mm -hmm. That's you know, from a financial planning standpoint. Jim team standpoint this is our best recommendation but I think next year you clearly will have a whole year now behind you you'll have a, a chance after June town meeting to start to prepare and structure this how you want to do it next year and maybe reduce it a little more or maybe take it all together but you can all you know, figure that out as you go along okay this is our best estimate please Continuing on, as I mentioned, there were no changes to other financing sources from the last meeting until today. You'll see we have our total general fund revenue available here. Moving down to the expense side of the revenue and expense plan, uh, you can see that the raise and appropriate portion of the capital improvement plan for FY20 um, has been uh, pulled out and will be funded uh, with free cash. One minor change doesn't change the, the grand total amount, but under retirements, school and municipal retirements, um, the grand total has always been 200,000. And um, the school's figure had about been 115,000, and the town's um, was uh, 85,000. <coughs> the town uh, allocated 25,000 of their allocation, or the municipal side, I should say, to the school as their school's actual retirement number is 139,000 and change. Mr. Masseri? Liz, what is the insurance percentage increase? I know it's been split, but... We're getting there, so the, that's okay. the next item. Are, are we talking about health insurance? Yes. Yes, so um, health insurance is being carried at 4.5% increase over FY19. So you can see that broken out. We have um, the PFA health insurance contingency line, <coughs> um, which is budgeted for a 4.5% increase uh, over FY19. And then we can go down to the school and municipal uh, health insurance breakout figures. And those figures are carried at 4.5% over FY19 with additional FTEs for um, operating budget additions. So the school's figure includes four additional full-time employees and the municipal's uh, health insurance uh, figure includes three additional uh, full-time employees at 15,000 uh, per employee that it, that's a full <coughs> benefit cost um, and it's an average depending upon if the individual took a family or um, individual plan it's a blended rate can we just maybe back up for a second I just want to point out to everyone again, school and municipal county retirement went up last year over 5%. This year it went up over 7%, 7.74% if I remember correctly. Again, it's trending a lot like health insurance. So I'm not so sure there's a PFA for county retirement, but I certainly think that the board needs to be aware that this trend isn't going down. It is going up, and that's a pretty rapid pace. Um, I don't know how we deal with it. I don't know how you handle it, but just continue to be very aware of that number. Uh, and I think we need a solution. Maybe it's talking to the legislators. 
to get us some help. Um, but the, the community and the boards and the school committee and everyone else needs to know that, that number has gone up almost 13% in two years. Is that just our population living longer? Is that just driving nope. that number? No, it's, it's the average wages and retirement payments are higher. In other words, the average wage, we, we've been carrying people, you know, who have been retired for 15 or 20 years, but they were paid at a, a much lower wage. Right. So now as people retire at the higher salary levels. Yeah. Is, but does the actuary of the people expected to live longer also impact that number as well? No. No, it's still going to go Not on. that no. number. Okay. Not that number. But Mr. O'Leary's right, and, 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 and you know what, and it's the right thing. I mean, yeah. these salaries should go up, but we should have a plan for it like we did with the PFA because we don't see this trending downward. It's going to be trending upward, and sooner or later it's going to get to a point where it, it may be a challenge. So I'm just pointing out as a, something on your to-do list for next year and the years following. The trend is not leveling off. Okay. Please Just continue unless someone else has a question. The retirement board does have to have um, the plan, their plan fully funded. Um, so it's similar to you know an OPEB plan. So they do have an actuarial study and tables that um, you know tell them what they need to achieve you know their their funding uh, strategy. And then we get assessed. Exactly. And then yes. we get assessed. Yes. To right. Meet their plan. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please continue. So no other changes um, under um, benefits. So then we come to, again, you can see the 68,141,000 available as uh, total general fund revenue that we saw on the first page. Our fixed costs, as we saw in the PowerPoint presentation, as well as above. Now, rem remember, fixed costs are ones that are not allocated to the school and municipal side. They're, they're shared jointly, so they come off the top. So those would be the regional school assessments, um, debt service, the school and municipal retirement figure for uh, retiree buyouts, not to be confused with the Middlesex County retirement assessment. Um, the general liability insurance, those, those type of items are included in that 11 million uh, figure that we see there. We then come down to the total municipal allocation um, and we break out um, the remaining fixed cost benefits uh, that are allocated to the municipal side as well as the school side. So you can see you know, county retirement, workers comp, unemployment, health insurance. Again, health insurance includes three full-time employees uh, carried at a rate of four and a half percent. Then we have some uh, revenue direct offsets, which um, in previous years were shown under other financing sources. Now they're broken out um, to directly offset uh, either the school or municipal budget. We have the trash fee, cemetery, perpetual care, ambulance, receipts, reserved account, water indirect costs, parks and rec indirect costs, and uh, transfer from 104 Lowell Road Revolving Fund, which was established at the June 2018 town meeting uh, to take permit revenue from 104 Lowell Road um, to offset the costs of additional inspection um, services. So there's uh, additional part-time inspectors that are required for this property. They are paid out of there. Uh, this year, now that we have revenue in the fund, we are taking the revenue out to offset the code enforcement um, operating budget. Excuse me, that's only $22,800? Yes. How did that, what formula was used to uh, I, I forget how we allocate or were to allocate some money from the revol into the revolving account to cover those inspection services. What did we do? So I, 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 the, my expectation was it was going to be greater. I'm sorry. I mean, my ex expectation was that the number would be greater. That's even now, even after the first buildings are in place and the fees are there, 
It's more than $22,000. Absolutely, there are greater fees than the 22000 <coughs> at this, this point. This is based upon um, a year's worth of inspections and the, the hours that the additional inspectors as well as the clerical overtime uh, that has been used and the building inspectors uh, time that has been used. So this is the best estimate that we have. And I know it's only been one building that has been built. I, I let the building um, inspectors you know, speak further on it, but we've spent a good, good amount of time analyzing the hours that have been spent on this property. Do you want more detail? Do you want the? Uh, maybe I know. I think I, I think I want more money. Uh, <laughs> I want more money for the for the inspectional services department. That's a net number then. Is the fees that came in minus the cost attributed to that? It's just for the costs. Yeah. It's F for just for occupancy permits, or is it for all no, permits? Excuse me. Yep. Yeah, it's got to come to the mic. I'm so sorry. If you could, wouldn't mind, Mr. Noel, coming to the mic. What? What that is, that's for, that's for the, the, the fees for the plumbing and electrical, uh, my fees, uh, the building inspector's fees, and a good amount of the clerical as well. Um, and it, it roughly ran it was about $7,800, Liz, right around there, $77,000, some $7,800, 7200 for the first building. You mean how much you brought in per revenue? No, 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 no. How much we, how much we, the, the expenditure to go two and a half times, how we basically came up with this number. Correct, yes. Yeah. So the number is fa fairly accurate. It's just that Pulte does come in with a new, with a new, uh, with another building, I should say, then we'd probably have to take money out of the Pulte fund, and, but that's something that Liz would, would have to if we run into a situation, we can do as we're doing this fiscal year, where we are moving the expenses uh, attributed directly to 104 Lowell Road to the revolving fund. Um, the reason that we did not do that for FY19 was that there was no revenue in there at that point when we were, you know, approving the operating budget. So we now have revenue available in the revolving fund and can transfer out of the revolving fund to offset the building department's budget. Ms. Minya Pelly. I thought we were doing the revolving fund to bring on additional contractors for you to alleviate the extra work that that involved. I thought we were doing it that I way for that, that, that purpose. That of question. <clears throat> the revolving fund was created at uh, June Town meeting to take all of the permit revenue received for 104 Lower Road and then use that permit revenue for the costs associated with any inspection fees, uh, any inspection services. So Out, I believe it was for outside services, right? right, right. To bring in contractors to assist yeah. you. That's what and we or. did it for. Or and or. And or. Yes, and, and he has high, he's using um, two temporary. Um, Electrical and plumbing inspectors. And I did try to outsource uh, uh, through a, an organization that I belong to, which is MBCIA. I did try to outsource with them to try to get a, a temporary building inspector, um, but to no avail, unfortunately. Um, and I think, it's, I, I think it was the money that I was offering. And I, they wanted 45 to $55 an hour, and I told them that was not going to fly. So. It's just, and, and I basically put it out for 30 an hour, and nobody took it. Nobody was interested. So I was just looking for part-time somebody who's re who, who was retired, so. So we have a lot more revenue available yes. in this fund. Correct. But this is all you're allocating for the current fiscal year based upon the past year's experience. Yes. They consider to be needs. Yeah. And I mean, to me, unless you plan on coming back, I mean, we have June town meeting and October town meeting, you know, but I, I can just anticipate that the needs are going to grow as they're moving ahead even more quickly ahead of schedule. Yeah. And we're going to be behind the eight ball when it comes to having an appropriation available 
to meet those needs. And I don't want to I not agree. be able to have the proper oversight. I do not necessarily want to overtax this guy here and his staff. In other words, if we have to bring on additional personnel or um, outside resources, we should have the, we do have the funds available to do so, and I think we need to, to allocate it now in anticipation of that. I just, this just seems $22,000 is next to nothing, even at 30 bucks, 30 bucks an hour that you're not going to get anybody to do it. But, uh, you know, if that's the case, the market out there is, is you know, 45 to $60 an hour. That's what the market is for someone out there to come and do it. And we need, we need the oversight, you know. We don't have a clerk of the works on site. And more and more of your time and hours are going to be expended to do that. Ms. Roy? I believe when we get to the next agenda item. Right. Um, that's what I was going to say. Is I think we do this. cover it. We but that's okay. But further. I think this is light. It may be. I think this is light. But I think we covered it in the revenue plan, right? We, I don't want you to think that this number represents the services that we are adding to it's the not 100%. enforcement budget. That, that doesn't represent that. So when we get to the next agenda item, I have an idea where he's going to go with this, and I think I support him and what he's trying to trying to say. But let's get to the other part of the agenda item, and then maybe we, we merge the two of these discussions together. Yes. Reserve the right to come back to this. Yes. 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 <laughs> Make sure that's in the minutes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. So. Yeah. We want. We'll come back to this. Yes. I think it's worthy of a continuation after we get through the next agenda item. So please continue. Moving on to the municipal level services um, budget, uh, the amount is sixteen million nine fifty, and we will see that in detail um, in the next agenda item. <coughs> Going on to the schools allocation um, and the direct expenditure offsets. Um, for the school departments, they're listed below, um, as we've seen in, uh, above. Uh, again, health insurance carried at 4.5% with four full-time employees added to their health insurance budget figure. Leaving um, the school's level services budget figure at 31757 And we could not balance out the uh, percentage allocations much further, which left six six dollars and twenty two cents available. Um, you can see that we went out quite a few places on on each uh, percentage allocation. Any other? Questions? Any questions on the expense and revenue plan? But again, I'm not totally satisfied at the four point five, but it's. I know you're happy to see that uh, at least I was heard. So, and hmm. I had a discussion with the yep. town administrator in relation to uh, his optimism in relation to the uh, the funds that will be available. So, yep. So be it. <coughs> now, I just want to point out that I want to thank the schools because <coughs> they really stepped up and came to the town's rescue, I'll say, for lack of a better term. And when we finish flushing this all out, you know, there's a couple things in the town administrator's budget that you're going to see here in the next agenda item that are, we <coughs> felt must haves, and we could not achieve to give the town administrator what he needs um, without the schools really stepping up and making cuts this year. So they're not even reaching their modified level services, okay? So in typical years, we try to get them to their modified level services, and they're not even near that. So um, I want to thank the, the superintendent and the school administration for working with the town. Um, in past years, we've tried to work with them to help them achieve that, and now this year, they're, they're working to help us achieve. And that's how you see the split out of the number. So Mr. Buck, we see you carrying the water for the school. Please pass along our sincere thank you for helping us get to a zero deficit for the, the town side because without your reasonableness and contribution we wouldn't be there okay mr. Gilberto so with the next agenda item calls for us to review the departmental requests and my recommendations and I believe the school committee will have a similar type discussion on Wednesday at a budget workshop 
in advance of a budget hearing on Monday. Is that correct? The 29th? So kind of we're working in parallel at this point in time. Yep. So if it's okay, we'll move to the next agenda item. And then we'll send these people home hopefully before 10 o'clock. So okay. um, the next agenda item uh, for the packet, we're on page 71, a uh, document <coughs> that uh, at the top of the page reads, Town of North Reading fiscal year 20 appropriation projection. Um, I've asked, uh, uh, I should say, after discussion, Excuse the me, fire Michael. chief. Mike, just yeah. board members, I know we've been here since 6 o'clock, so anybody want to take a five minute recess or you're good to continue? We're good. If you need to get up and do whatever, please just go ahead. We're going to continue, but don't be afraid to move along. But thank you. So, uh, before you are my uh, recommendations uh, relative to the fiscal year 2020 budget, um, one of those recommendations is that. Um, due to limited resources, we are not able to fund the fire prevention captain that was requested by the fire chief in his budget request and was reviewed on March 2nd. Um, so uh, that's something that we just were not able to recommend funding for at this point in time, um, although it's not necessarily a reflection of the merit uh, of the request or of the need, we're just not able to fund uh, that particular request at this point in time. The fire chief is here um, to uh, present an update to his budget and to provide some information that um, the board may find useful on the follow-up of the March 2nd budget presentation. So I would like him to go through his presentation at this point in time, if that's okay. He's only got a couple of slides, uh, five slides, I think, actually, before we ended up. Please don't. It's You're welcome to sit at the mic or use the mom Great, thank podium. You. Thank you. I think this is seven, seven slots. Like to start off by saying this is well past my bedtime, so. Chief, which two slides do you want to get rid of? <laughs> Getting the steps in tonight. Chief Stats. Good evening. Don Stats, Fire Chief. This is an update to the Fire Department's FY20 budget presentation that you heard on March 2nd. I left that meeting realizing there were several or maybe several unanswered questions that I wanted to make sure I had an opportunity to address and also report on some changes that have occurred within the department. <clears throat> Since my original presentation on March 2nd, there was an unexpected retirement, as well as recommendations made by the Public Safety Director, Finance Director, and Town Administrator, one of which you just heard. As you will hear during the, or as you have heard during the Town Administrator's budget uh, proposal, he's not recommending my request for an addition, additional personnel at this time. As you will see on this slide, uh, I've decreased my overtime request by $73,000 since the March 2nd budget hearing. In addition to the decrease in overtime, the overall budget request was decreased by $183,000. That includes the uh, removal of the fire prevention officers. So I thought that was a significant change that I wanted to make sure the board was aware of. <clears throat> in addition to these points, I have reevaluated the trends uh, to this point in the department and made further adjustments since the November submission of the fire budget based on those results. Um, this was the request in overtime. It compares fiscal 19 to fiscal year 20. The yellow highlighted areas are some of the further changes that I've made that I'll address uh, in the upcoming slides. <coughs> the most significant areas of change are an increase in station coverage hours of 24 or 385 hours, $24,000, a decrease in the callback hours of 500 hours. EMT training was increased by 432 hours. Fire training was increased by 376 hours. Uh, recruit training was increased by 504 hours. And group restructuring was decreased by 384 hours. When I was promoted to the, 
to Chief of the Department over a year ago, one of my top priorities was to be fiscally responsible. This was a top priority to me because four of the five past budget cycles saw the fire department consistently exceeding its budget. Well, this sounds simple to most people, it's extremely challenging the service whose overtime demands fluctuate and are dictated by call volume and frankly hard to predict, let alone control. I began to evaluate what I could do to improve fiscal efficiencies. Because of our current staffing levels, the fire department is dependent on its off-duty personnel to come back on overtime to cover the station when we transport by ambulance, respond to another community in the fire truck, and when we have an incident or potential incident in our own community. I made several changes in two areas that I felt would make us more fiscally and operationally efficient. I implemented a change in the station coverage policy as well as box alarm uh, callback policy. I am, uh, implemented a policy regarding dispatch where we now staff that 24 hours a day around the clock, as well as a change regarding our mutual aid policy and the amount of resources that we now supply to another community. I looked at the mutual aid ambulance calls that was brought up during my March 2nd presentation as a positive for both the fire department and our members and for positive cost recovery and member skills and development. One of the issues that was brought up during the March 2nd presentation was private insurance companies seeking to make changes within, within their own policies and what they could, would now cover. Uh, that was, I did evaluate that, I reached out and I looked into it, and that has been trying to occur for the past nine years. Um, it's been unsuccessfully implemented by the private insurance companies, but they are trying to do it. So we are watching that and making sure. Uh, I've been assured by our ambulance billing company, should that ever occur, it, the change would not happen overnight. It would take time to actually implement it. So we'd have time to adjust. Um, per our ambulance billing company, I want to assure the board that our collection rates remain very successful, fluctuating between 80 and 85 percent, depending on the month. Uh, I will be monitoring, uh, excuse me, one of the questions presented to me during the budget hearing regarding the disproportionate uh, amount of ambulance calls that we provide to other communities. One of the concerns of the board was the balance of the cost recovery versus the callback system currently in place and sometimes our staffing levels not responding back on our calls. Uh, I can assure you that in, I am watching that trend, and in my up upcoming slides, uh, I will be discussing this further. <coughs> Sorry. The way the fire department is currently structured works. It works now, but I don't believe it may not be the most efficient uh, method, both fiscally and operationally. I'm currently evaluating and will continue to work to evaluate for the, for the foreseeable future the department's structure, operations, and manning in order to meet our growing community's needs. As part of that evaluation, I'll be looking at our alternative funding sources as well to meet those needs. But first, this is a model of what I think the department could look like in anywhere from three to five years. Our current structure is based in red. The other uh, blue and green are what I would propose in the future, with the blue being the fire prevention captain. So moving to a model of a chief, a deputy chief, a fire prevention officer, a captain, a lieutenant, and six firefighters. So regarding uh, alternative funding sources to help the community meet that need, uh, I've already been looking into the SAFER grant, which stands for Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response. Uh, this is a three-year performance-based grant that is offered by the federal government. There is a match by the community of 25% for the first two years of the grant and 65% in the third year. So simply put, if we were to hire four firefighters uh, the grant would cover three of the four for the first two years. That is what I had to present as an update for the fire department budget. Does anybody have any questions? Mrs. Minnie Pelly? So, but if, just Chief, if you, that's great. Thank you for this update. Um, this um, 
year one, year two, year three, but then once the grant is over, you're laying them off, you're laying the extra staff off. Well, hopefully not, but uh, we'd have to find a way to fund that and to keep the personnel. But there is no requirement that we keep them beyond the three years. No, but I think the most important thing to look back on is several months ago we had the pre presentation about the fire department overall and its service calls going up and then talking about you know what's the right fit with the overtime and verse adding more men or women people we'll call it um, and I think this is the safer grant would help support meet those <coughs> challenges that we have because at some point you're gonna have to fund it we know the fire department can't stay at the level it's at now the service calls are just getting too great in with the addition of future developments coming and more existing developments growing uh, I think it's something that you know doesn't have to be done 2020 but it's certainly you know the plan this I think works it ties in uh, and I think you have to do something like this and then once you get to that three-year commitment that we should have to fund it anyway because it's important the fire department's calls for service seem to increase by 10% every year. What is more uh, alarming are the multiple and back-to-back -back calls that are happening, which really tax our staff. Uh, and we do a very good job of, of handling just about 90% of calls all on our own, 95% of all medical aids on our own. So where we provide mutual aid to other communities, probably just proportionately because of our unique system we're able to handle our own calls within our own community I would say 95% of the time the last time I looked yes chief what uh, you just mentioned your calls are going up 10% a year what do you attribute that to it's hard to say um, we have growth in population we have uh, just increased people calling for service uh, so it's that's that's all. Seems I like a big number. It's, yeah. 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 We've got an aging population population too. All oh, population. Increase in aging. Yeah. Population. Yeah. I think. Mr. Masseri. More traffic. It would seem to me increasing the overall structure would have an impact on reducing some of the overtime that is a result of the current structure. That that is true. So what, that would be in negotiations uh, or a negotiable item with the union. However, I do feel that that. If we were to increase it, that would definitely be a viable option to help us. I look at it a little differently. I'm not so sure this is cost savings, but I certainly think we eliminate more of the risk when the callback is out there and not enough guys come back, which yeah. is of concern. As these buildings in town are getting could taller. A reduction, Michael. I'm sorry. Without a change in the structure of the current contract. Because what you're doing is avoiding situation sure. where you have additional staff in house yep. to deal with the situation that might occur. In one of my prior presentations, I looked at that reduction in overtime not as a savings, but as a reallocation into more manpower. We're, we're not going to save anything. We're, our budget will, or the budget will go up, but it won't go up as significantly as uh, if we had that overtime cost on top of that. No, I, I completely understand that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Any very much. Any other questions for the chief? Thank the director of public chief. safety as well, because I know you put a lot of time in this as well. Thank you both for your effort on it. It's certainly helpful. Thank you. So on the heels of that, Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I'd like to go through my recommendations. And, um, you know, for, for purposes of trying to keep the content manageable we condensed it all into basically one um, single page spreadsheet um, the resultant impact is you know, we, we have an eight page or so no, 14 page or so budget that gets voted at town meeting that we would need to go through an update to reflect this but you know to try to summarize for discussion purposes what the changes will be which we intend to affect in that with the board's approval uh, I'll go through this <coughs> so starting from the top I'll just take it by department so we're on page 71. We're on page 71 of the document of the, uh, the the main select board packet. That's correct. And I'm going to take the departments in order. And I'll just point your attention to the FY20 department request. So that there's um, six columns: the departments on the left, 
the revised budget for FY19 follows it, then the department's request, which is what you heard at the hearings over the past six weeks, the FY20 TA recommendation, this is the first time you're seeing a recommendation from me on any of these departments, as well as uh, what, the, um, what the difference is between my recommendation and what the department requested with notes to the right of that describing it. So select board and the town moderator are fully funded at the departmental request for the uh, town administrator's department. Um, this uh, budget would fund uh, the department's budget, including a settled contract for uh, my position, as well as the proposed uh, grant writer, grant manager slash project manager position that was uh, identified in my budget presentation. So this uh, recommendation would fund that. Uh, and it is in line with the allocated resources under the revenue and expense plan. For human resources, the salary pool, finance committee, reserve fund, finance director, accounting, uh, all the way through on that list um, down to community planning. Um, their departmental requests would be fully funded at the level that was requested. Uh, I would note that in the salary pool is uh, an allowance that we are carrying uh, for unsettled collective bargaining and also for uh, areas where we have contracted employees where we believe there will be a need for uh, an adjustment as well. Um, it is uh, carried forth in the salary pool. Um, the changes were not significant in those particular departments. They're mainly administrative in nature, as you can see. Um, so we were able to fund those. Um, under the Board of Appeals, uh, for the past three years, we've been staffing the Board of Appeals uh, with the Building Department's Administrative Assistant um, working um, a few hours beyond the regular work week to provide support to the Board of Appeals. And the feedback I've received and also the, um, the very little um, complaint that I've received as well, it appears that that structure has been working in place of the um, part-time administrative assistant position that once existed there. Um, so we have the person who's serving the building inspector who also works directly with the building, uh, with the Board of Appeals, um, in, in that administrative assistant also working directly with the Board of Appeals now as well. It does result in a cost savings which we're effectively reallocating to a similar type position um, later on, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, the police department, um, you know, this was a, a challenging area for us, uh, as the select board knows. In the FY 2019 budget, we were able to approve funding for um, uh, police civilian dispatch effective April 1st. The um, police chief and the human resources director have been working um, alongside um, the finance director and also with the collective bargaining uh, unit um, in discussions with them relative to um, implementing that change uh, with the goal of April 1st. Uh, we obviously did not uh, obtain that goal uh, in time for that, that period of time. Um, although we were at a point where I think we you know, could have consulted uh, further with the board relative to our options to implement it. But there, at the same time, there's additional information that has come forward relative to our options, uh, which we are certainly you know, not committing to any option, but feel that we need to look at more closely. And that includes a, a regional dispatch um, that uh, you know, was uh, experiencing some difficulties in its early years, but appears to have straightened out a bit in more recent years, and for which the state is now offering additional incentives to cities and towns. So I want to be clear to everybody uh, you know, who's maybe watching this video or, or you know, hearing of this meeting later on, no decision's been made at this point in time relative to uh, what the right option is for dispatch, but there is a need for us to review what the options are, including you know, the potential opportunities down the road for combined dispatch with the fire department and how that might work. Um, I think you know, we had done some initial work on that leading up to the budget in fiscal year 2019. We continued looking at that under the stewardship of the public safety director and the assistance of the, of the, uh, the fire chief. Um, and we identified what some of the options are, but there are, are obviously some concerns as well. And you know, what that all means is that uh, I'm not prepared to recommend that we continue the exercise uh, in its current form at this point in time, uh, although I believe it's something that we need to carefully evaluate um, uh, with, um, within uh, and in discussion with our uh, collective bargaining units for potential consideration for fiscal year 2021. So for that reason, uh, I'm not recommending funding it uh, moving into fiscal year uh, 2020. Uh, that results in a reduction of the police department's budget request of $208,546. It does otherwise fully fund um, the departmental request. 
Um, as we've identified by doing the department or um, the, 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 com the uh, civilian dispatch for the police department, we were going to create two um, new uh, service positions within the police department um, that uh, we're not able to fund at this point in time because we're not making this change. Um, you know, I, I've talked with the chief, and they are, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but they are you know, doing their best with the resources that they have available right now. Um, it does not mean that we may not operate more efficiently or, or perhaps even more effectively with, a, um, with that change being in effect, but it's not something that we're prepared to recommend, at least at this point in time. The chief, fire chief did mention um, the, uh, some of the changes to his budget, and those changes in conjunction with not funding the fire prevention captain at this time result in a reduction in his request of $111,032. Code enforcement. So uh, <coughs> effectively what we've done here is we've taken the building inspector's request to provide the services that were needed for fiscal year 2020 in the department, including to address the development at 104 Lowell Road. And uh, we funded it as follows. Um, we would be able to fund an additional full-time building inspector. So this would be in addition to the full-time building inspector that, uh, position that Mr. Noel um, uh, occupies right now. We would also have a part-time building inspector position, which Mr. Noel requested at 20 hours per week, but under this scenario would be recommended at 16 hours per week. Uh, part-time and we believe we have um, the ability to identify a candidate for that position um, to assist us in that capacity would also reduce the clerical overtime for the permitting software implementation which I mentioned earlier this evening when we were discussing the warrants uh, for the town meeting um, that warrant article will fund any of that uh, work that's required for the implementation it is one time it's not necessarily appropriate for the operating budget because once the project is up and up and running it's going to no longer be needed um, so you know what we would do here is uh, also increase responsibility for the building inspector position which in consultation with the public safety director and the building inspector we believe is the appropriate um, step for us so that he may remain involved in the oversight of the Polte project as well as the management of the department. And putting all those things together, we believe that we have addressed the need in the department for fiscal year 2020. You see that we have in there the uh, so-called offset in the amount of $22,862. Um, that, as the building inspector reflected uh, earlier, represents uh, the um, amount of work over fiscal year 20. 19 that was associated with the um, Polte development. Um, that number, I, I don't think, and you know, any one of the three of you can disagree, it's not set in stone. It's something that we're going to need to continue to monitor as the construction ramps up. Um, it's a revolving fund. It's something that we have a bit more flexibility to charge costs against as there's an increase in workload if, it, if need be. Um, but we believe that this this is the to the best the information available tells us at this point in time that's what the projection is right now um, as construction ramps up we have the opportunity to revisit it um, I, I am and the three individuals here participated in the conversation are well aware I am of the camp of that number should be as large as possible <laughs> when I look at it but at the same time we, we, we were dealing with the restriction of what we could justify based on the workload at least uh, to date um, that doesn't prevent us from updating it, and uh, believe me, I'll be the first person to say that it should be updated when we have the data that backs up doing that. When uh, money still has to be appropriated, is it a revolving fund through town meeting? So I'll let the finance director speak to that. We have a couple of options. Um, I, I've been of the, the feeling that to the extent possible, Mr. Noel's budget request for 2020 ought to reflect what he believes the totality of the work will be for the department for fiscal year 2020. <coughs> And that we should identify the portion of that total work that is Polte related and offset it with funding. But that's not our only option for doing it. I'll let this finance director speak to that. Ms. Roark. We do not need town meeting approval to use the revolving fund. So we can um, transfer uh, expenditures from the uh, code enforcement operating budget that are attributed to 104 Lower Road off to the revolving. And if the demand significantly increases, would you have the flexibility to do that and also retain outside services or contract services or increase hours for the part-time individual? As long as there is revenue available within the revolving fund, yes. 
That includes increasing the hourly wage that may be needed to acquire the right resources? That's a separate issue outside of uh, myself that could be, you know, procurement uh, related, uh, but yes, you know, as long as we are following the procurement rules, Correct. Um, there's no issue with using the revolving funds to pay for 104 Lowell Road related services. And I, you know, I we've talked um, about this, and you know, it would be something that we would use, you know, um, judicious, uh, ju ju judiciously. Excuse me. <coughs> Clearly, haven't had anything to drink in a while. Um, it, something we would review with the board, you know, prior to doing. But you know, as we did when we needed to acquire the second um, plumbing and gas inspector um, in July, I think it was. We reviewed that with the board. We would handle it similarly, but we have the flexibility to be able to to make the adjustments. I don't want to say on the fly, but pretty much as close to it as we can under municipal finance law. Um, so I think we feel that this structure addresses the need. Um, you know, we've had some conversation about where we are at today, too. That's something, obviously, to be concerned about because we have the end of the fiscal year, you know, to get to at this point. And uh, you know, I spoke with the building inspector, and again, after the first part of this discussion earlier, to confirm with him that you know, we, we are in a position where we are, we believe we will, the, the goal is to be ready on July 1st to hire that person. We have a full-time building inspector position that we're looking to hire. We would ordinarily not, um, not proceed with the hiring process until after town meeting took, took place. But we are in a position here where we do have the alternative funding source that does not necessarily require that town meeting authorization if it came to that. Um, so I think we're all comfortable that the, the plan is implement as soon as possible so that we can hit the ground running with that position as soon as possible. Um, which to us would be on July 1st. That, that's the intention. And the building inspector was comfortable that we can meet the demand on the interim basis as we're you know, about 70 odd days out. He looks yeah. comfortable sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we've, we've, I, I should say we, we've struggled with this because you know, we wanna, we're trying to build the right system for dealing with this, but we know that it's not a permanent setup. And we, we have a few things that I'll say are kind of aligning our way, including you know, a potential retirement that may be interested in assisting us on a part-time basis afterwards that will help us to kind of fill the, the need in town with someone knowledgeable of the town um, you know, for a short term. So I, I think it took us a year to figure it out, admittedly. We had a plan a year ago that we were here with um, that uh, just w would not work and could not work uh, properly. We fine-tuned it to reflect the need that we feel at this point in time. You satisfied, Mr. O'Leary? Somewhat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just in relation to uh, the other uh, uh, health and health department, uh, you didn't get there yet, right? Didn't get there yet. Okay. okay. I'll wait. Okay. Um, so continuing through emergency management, the the departmental request would be fully funded. The Department of Public Works, um, we uh, would not be able to fund in this recommendation, unfortunately, the additional mechanic or two tree care positions that were requested by TPW, DPW, as well as three small capital items that were within the department. Um, you know, we tried to look at where, where the needs were, and unfortunately, we just were not able to balance all of this. Under the fuel budget, um, Excuse me, does that mean, like, uh, as far as the mechanics, is, is that mean we're going to be farming more of the business out for repairs? Or? So I, I think, I can't say that it will be more, um, and there is an effort underway to try to, 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 to farm out less between the public safety departments and the public works uh, department. Um, so I, I think in the, I'll say that in the worst case scenario, it would continue as it's been operating for the past couple of years, but there's a pilot that's been underway with shared resources to temporarily you know, not temporarily, I should say, to try to build a model of reducing what we farm out. So we've been trying to work cooperatively to do that um, over the past, it's a few months at this point in time, right, Chief? And I think it's been to some success where they've been, you know, I'm looking at the DPW director as well, they've dedicated some time during the week for servicing the public safety vehicles and it's been able to work a little more smoothly than it did in the past. Um, but we're not, not cutting anything that was already dedicated, that wasn't already dedicated or that, that was already dedicated to vehicle maintenance over the past couple of years. It's only the new position. So uh, any anticipated retirements? There is one um, that, that is somewhat on the horizon, although I, I don't know if we have a date yet for uh, that individual in the suite. I'm looking to confirm. We do not yet, but it is on the horizon, something that we need to be um, monitoring. And what were the three small capital items? 
I'd have to defer to the finance director because I don't remember offhand. The cemetery UTV, um, the skid steer attachment, right. and the line painting. The line painting. So, uh, you know, we're, we're concerned about the cemetery, and, you know, some who have drive by there may have noticed that there was some attention put to the gate in the front. It's been painted a brighter shade of green, which we appreciate. If I saw that correctly, Pat, um, thank you. So, you know, we're trying to tend to it. We did put some investment in it last year. Um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's just a matter of trying to, to balance all the priorities, and uh, unfortunately, uh, these items were not able to be funded. I do think, though, that the tree service, the tree positions, I do hope it comes back up next year mm -hmm. and you guys give it serious, serious discussion. It, it's a huge safety thing for the town and the response time to have our own people be able to do it, uh, I think it's almost borderline priceless. So, I, I agree with you. We, we have contracted services that we had reduced and with the understanding of these positions being funded, we had to increase that contracted services back up to continue the, the program that we've been following here. Um, it, it's not ideal. Um, we all know this community. We all know the, the uh, I'll call it the suburban forest that we have here. I mean, it's intertwined with the things that the department does daily. And uh, I agree, it's something that needs to be a priority. Uh, uh, but I'm we really just weren't able to find it. I'm really disappointed we couldn't get it done this year. I really am. <coughs> Um, there was an adjustment in the fuel budget to re request to, um, to implement the uh, settled contract for uh, the position of town administrator in the amount of fifteen hundred dollars. In sanitation, there's an update to reflect the increased disposal fee at Covanta. So we are still on track for a uh, zero percent increase with JRM for collection, uh, but for Covanta, which is where we dispose of the trash, there will be an increase in that uh, in that rate. So this ten thousand dollar uh, increase would reflect that. Excuse me, Mr. Masseri? Michael, with respect to the fuel, Washington's been talking about an increase. Uh, I guess the approach to take would be to, uh, if necessary, make an adjustment in October, Tommy? If necessary, I think, and I have to be honest, I have not looked at the trends for this year, but we've had quite a bit of wiggle room in fuel over the past few years, so. I know we'll monitor, monitor it and see where it's at. If there is a need to adjust it, we could adjust it in October. Yeah, but they, they are talking about it. That's why I bring it up. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Masseri. Well, the state is. Right. It's, that's, it's the no, state. Yeah, okay. The state is also talking about increasing the yeah. fuel tax yeah. in order to fund something specific. Um, where was I? So in the health department, what this effectively does is uh, it fully funds the health department's request, um, which included additional uh, food inspection services, five additional hours for the public health nurse, which would go from five hours to ten hours. And my recommendation is actually to add an additional five hours to that position that would become available for human services needs, um, what be it in the youth services department for veterans or for elder affairs. Um, I'll call it a bit of a pilot and we've got some pre preliminary and expect more in input from our uh, interim public health nurse who's here this evening. Uh, Pam, thank you for being here. And thank you for your assistance. It's going to continue to evolve, but you know, I spoke, I think, earlier or I've at least spoken informally with some of the board members about you know, the model of trying to get nursing you know, more directly involved in the outreach. Sue Swansburg did a great job for us over the, the you know, past few years, probably more than we were allocating for. Um, but uh, I think, you know, with her not being here and having that, you know, that turnover, it's an opportunity for us to look at, you know, w what else could we be doing with the position. And, you know, Pam is going to be providing us some input in addition <coughs> to what she's provided us already. Um, so, you know, our feeling is that this address, uh, that addresses this. I, I do have to note that, you know, we're in this significant period of transition with the uh, food inspections. Um, you know, we, we, I spoke at the last meeting about the challenges of the establishments learning what their obligations are and the impact on the, the nonprofit uh, organizations that are out there. You know, I, I think our hope is that the impact will settle down when we get into year two of the new food code, but we don't know that that's going to be the case. So I really have to caution that there is the, the, you know, the possibility that we may need, may, may need to designate additional resources towards this in fiscal year 2021 or perhaps even sooner. So I just, I feel it's important to note that. Um, 
but you know, at this point, we're able to fund what the department had requested, and then some um, with the public health nursing. Um, Michael, but doesn't the board of health licensee have to take some responsibility as well to make maybe make investments in consulting services? to assist them along the way too. Yeah, it's been a great model that Mr. Bracey's brought to a couple of establishments to say, hey, you really need to work with somebody. Um, but it does not alleviate, um, it does not alleviate the health department. I know, but it, I think we need to encourage those vendors that have uh, these licenses. You know, again, they are a privilege, not an entitlement. And if they, if they have to make the investment to get there, I mean, I think we obviously have to be reasonable timing, but mm -hmm. you get two, three years down the road and we still haven't implemented fully. Mm -hmm. I think it's a concern, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's concerning, but the taxpayers can't keep hiring the services to do that job when the licensee has a responsibility as well. So there has to be a balance there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'll, you know, the public safety director is here, Ms. Vath is here, but I can certainly convey that to Mr. Bracey as well. You know, the the more, more we can encourage that, you know, the better. Um, it's, and it's more than just, you know, managing the crisis. It's, yeah. you know, making sure you're in compliance day to day and preventing the crisis. Just in relation to our ability to uh, meet the demands, uh, particularly this time of the year, okay, because uh, when it comes to um, the health department and inspectional services for, uh, say, new s uh, septic system installations, uh, you know, they're basically four months where nothing is allowed, and then 1st of April comes and um, everybody's ready to go. and. You know, we've got a, a situation here where we provide two days a week for inspections uh, and we're six to eight weeks behind on our ability to meet the demands. Uh, how are we looking to address that? Are we looking to address that? Uh, not just going forward, but in the current fiscal year. Uh, I mean, I will so say publicly that, you know, I've been getting calls from installers who are saying, you know, I'm six, eight, I'm ready to go, our equipment's ready to go, we're, you know, Sale of homes are, you know, being delayed because something systems need to be upgraded, things of that nature, and it's because of our inability to meet the demands. Again, particularly this time of year, uh, it's it's nothing new. It's a seasonal, particularly you know April, May, June, um, but even throughout the year. But when we're running six or eight weeks out for inspections, that that's not uh, meeting the demands of the general public out there, and it's impacting the ability of uh, development, sale of homes, and a whole host of other issues. So what's our posture at this particular point in time? Are we looking to address it? Are we looking to address it? And uh, what can we do? So we met, uh, you know, we've had a number of discussions about this issue, and you know, what we you know, believe is happening is you know, th there is a, uh, seasonal surge in activity that that does happen you know each year and this particular year it's made more challenging uh, by the uh, an increase in the market the market has been hot and anyone driving around town sees for sales signs can see that that's what's going on but also that the resources from the department are being stretched you know back towards those food inspection obligations as well so that, that's having an impact so the public safety director myself um, the uh, finance director and the health inspector um, we've had discussion about making a request to the Finance Committee for assistance potentially um, to try to carry us through um, uh, the balance of the fiscal year. Um, the goal would be for us to provide uh, additional hours uh, in, um, in, uh, in septic service uh, uh, oversight, so whether it's deep hole testing that's being done or other inspections associated with that, we want to try to fr free up some time for the, uh, for the director to do it or for an additional resource to come in and assist us with it. Um, you know, the, 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 unfortunately, we, there haven't been a ton of options that are out there for us to contract that out, and it's also something that you know you, it, it needs to be nimble because, from the way I understand it, the installer is there, the hole's dug, and they need to, it needs to be looked at now. Um, so when you're talking about scheduling the inspector to come out there, it's a lot easier when you're talking about your own employee rather than when you're talking about a contractor that you need to then try to get on the schedule for. So we've been trying to look at what the options are, and uh, you know, it, admittedly. We're struggling with what the perfect model is, but I think our plan is by the end of this week to have something to present to the finance committee to say we need to, to make it through to the end of the fiscal year um, and to implement it. So I, I can't sit here and tell you exactly what it's going to be at the moment, and the health inspector is, uh, is uh, new back here in town on Wednesday, and we'll, we'll finalize that with him at that point. 
but um, we do intend to do something this fiscal year. I mean, maybe we could uh, take a look at uh, some other communities who have sewage. <coughs> you know, they have health inspectors. I'm sure they're busy doing what they're doing, but maybe they could free up some of the time with their inspectors and do some shared um, services with other communities, at least on a seasonal basis, um, to meet our demands. Mm -hmm. Again, those communities that don't have to do septic system inspections, uh, obviously, uh, may have some resources on a temporary basis to assist us, as we have sent our people to their communities to assist them in their time of needs, whether the inspector you know, leaves or moves out for some, uh, some other reason. I know that we've shared mm -hmm. you know, our health inspector and building inspector services over the years. Um, so maybe to get over the hump this year, because again, it's a significant amount of activity this year, just driving up around the streets, you see all the for sale signs. Uh, in addition to just upgrades of people's systems that need to be done anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and I think something needs to be done over the next six, eight weeks. Mr. Schultz? Yeah, I just want to say, as someone who's in the business of conveyancing, um, I haven't seen a span of problem in North Reading at all. I've seen it in other towns we've dealt with that have septic, and I've seen Title V's delay closings. I've seen fire departments not be able to get to do smoke certs. I think North Reading, we're better than most right now as far as the timing to get these things back. I haven't, I see this across Eastern and Central Mass. Central Mass is a ton of towns that have septic. And I've seen delays, but I have not seen one in a closing in North Reading. So I think, you know, I don't want the public to think that we're behind the eight ball here. I think our service, you know, why it, while it could be better, I think it is certainly satisfactory right now. No, but I do believe that we're on top of it because we have some people stretched way too thin. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to get addressed. Well, I, I so. think it, you know, the health inspector isn't here, but maybe the public safety director can address it. I, I believe we're six to eight weeks out on being able to, uh, the current workload. Never mind what's continuing to come in. I don't see how that's acceptable. I know it certainly wouldn't be for I, me I, if I, I were I, on the other end of it. You could just state who you are so the folks at home. Uh, Michael Murphy, police chief. Um, so we've had discussions with Bob. Um, I'm not sure about six to eight weeks, yeah, um, but there certainly is a backup. Um, but we met on Friday. We do have a plan in place. Uh, we have to go in front of the finance committee to get approval for it, but hopefully by next week at this time, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we should be able to implement that plan. Okay. Well, I'm glad something's going to be done this season. Thank you. Um, okay, I, I just I hope that answers your question. But um, you know, Bob isn't back yet, but we just want to finalize. With him. Do we have a goal that we want to try to achieve? I don't know if you guys have something you structured. Do you want to get it to three weeks, four weeks, eight? You know, we were looking at a nine-week plan. Probably it's seasonal, though. I mean, it's a seasonal it, issue. Correct. Yeah. That's so this problem. this all came about April first is when they start the inspections. Um, unfortunately, we've had. The food code, the new food code came in, so that backed him up a little bit on the on the beginning of April. So, yeah. And plus, no. we had a mild winter, so all these contractors are chopping at the bit and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Correct. They all called at once, and that was the unfortunate part of it. Um, so, Bob's been out of town for ten days, which, you know, I don't want to say added to the problem, but it was a um, pre-planned vacation. Um, you know, so we're trying to manage that as well. Um, but like I said, once he gets back. Um, we've we've discussed a plan with the um, Board of Health Chairman, uh, with the Town Administrator, and we're hoping that um, we can utilize the outside services like you were speaking of. Uh, Bob does utilize um, some resources from other communities that we're hoping he's going to be able to get them to come in, depending on what their schedules are like. But we haven't had contact with them, so it's difficult for us to actually say we're going to be implementing this plan this week. Getting in, into the, the current budget proposal for the upcoming year, yeah. So it's, it's not necessarily factored in. Correct. So that was again that was addressed. Um, we had a meeting on Friday. This seems to be, and this is the first we've really heard about this actual surge that occurs each April. Um, we're going to follow up with Bob to you know to determine does this happen on an annual basis or is this something because of the increase in the demand the you know the houses homes for sale but there's been a lot of um you know additions on homes and, and such um, as a building inspector can attest to that has also caused now this you know this rush and you uh, know 
and we, we feel for the um, contractors as well because, you know, their jobs are being essentially delayed as well, um, you know, and they want to keep their people working and, you know, they have other jobs that they have to attend to. So um, we're trying to balance all of that. Um, but, you know, the, the food court has really made a huge impact on the amount of time Bob can actually dedicate to the inspections. Um, but that's not fair to the contractors either, so that's the balance that we're you know, and I, and I think, you know, with a, a previous health inspector, his forte and, and expertise was more in the, uh, the septic and sanitary uh, disposal field, uh, whereas Bob's is more in the food, food, food inspection Correct. services. Um, and there in itself also, I mean, where, you know, Martin was here, we contracted out a lot of the services for food inspection and stuff, whereas now we know we need to contract out conversely for the uh, uh, septic systems. So I think in just so the board's aware too, and the reason why we're looking to the finance committee for extra funding is the food code went into effect in October. Uh, it was not supposed to go into effect until July, as far as Bob understood when he presented his budget last year. So the additional 600 hours that he has to do on an annual basis uh, was kind of dropped on his lap. And he has you know, managed that up to this point, but we've recognized that um, we believe we need, you know, about five hours a week to offset some of his time so he can dedicate that five hours to the inspections um, for the next nine weeks. So that's the funding that we're going to be requesting. And, you know, Bob believes that that should help alleviate some of the backup. But I, like I said, I'm not sure if it's actually six to eight weeks. My understanding, he, it was mid-May at this point that he was booking out, um, you know, but I could certainly make sure that yeah, I, I don't know, as I've heard from some contractors who were told six weeks, you know. <clears throat> I mean, I know the, yeah. the contractors went in to the uh, last Board of Health meeting as well. Um, do they, you know, they discussed their concerns there, and, and the Board of Health chairman um, came to us with his concerns as well. And, and um, you know, we're, we're all, we all understand what the issue is. It's about that, you know, just implementing the plan that we've come up with. <laughs> Great. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Your effort. And I just hope that the upcoming budget will reflect the needs and recognize the, the timing issues that we have going forward, too. Okay. Anything else? Yep. Um, going forward to the next department, Elder Services, um, my recommendation would be to increase the existing outreach coordinator position to 25 hours. The request was to go to 35 hours in the increase. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, we were not able to fund that, but uh, we are able to add uh, additional time, which will uh, assist in the operation of the um, the uh, elder uh, Department of Elder Affairs, as well as with um, the work that may be need that, that will need to be done associated with the ARP program. So we'll have to provide some capacity that will provide uh, the ability for the department to continue to facilitate that. For veteran services, um, their request included a request for a part-time administrative assistant in the department um, the grade of which uh, has not yet been determined in the position but uh, I am pleased that uh, we are able to recommend uh, that request and fund that request in this budget it's long awaited <laughs> uh, by Susan uh, over there and uh, it will be certainly a significant amount of assistance uh, in the department and um, we were, we're pleased that we're able to you know, recommend it at this point in time and, and work it into the funding plan um, unfortunately, we were not able to fund the library programmer position in the fiscal year 2020 budget for the library. Uh, I think that that's a fantastic, you know, opportunity for the library, but uh, not one that we were able to fund in the context of all the competing needs. Um, and then the recreation and youth services budgets were um, fully funded at the department's request. So I know that that is a lot of information reviewed, you know, pretty quickly, but um, uh, that is, a, I think, a, a, you know, an accurate snapshot of what the modifications we're recommending to the budget would be, and it would be our intention to present a budget for the board to vote to approve on May 6th that reflects the totality of these, uh, these items. You can see that the departmental requests totaled $17.5 million dollars but that my recommendation is that $16.950 million number resulting in the need for us to have cut approximately $572,000 from the departmental request. So, um, you know, 
I, I just would note that that's five hundred seventy-two thousand dollars worth of needs that were identified by our departments over the past. Uh, at this point probably nine months or eight months in the budget planning exercise um, that we're not going to be able to meet and um, you know I, I think something that we'll all keep in mind as we move into future budget processes and as we look at the available resources for the town I think we're optimistic that the continued uh, new growth will allow us to get there but we also know that we have competing capital needs so we have uh, you know uh, other needs that are out there that we need to be wary of but uh, if, uh, if approved, you know, this budget would effectively have us balanced with what the available resources are. And um, I know that the process has been different this year in the way that we've done it, but, um, and, and I know that it's caused for things to be compressed towards the end of the budget process, but we do have two weeks before there's a need for a final vote to take place on this. Um, I, I do feel that it allowed us to come to you with a recommendation that considered the feedback during the budget process and the totality of the needs that were out there. Um, and um, you know, I think um, you know, we would ask for your support. And I want to thank Liz for all of her work uh, up until about midnight on Thursday night last week to get this uh, to where it is, as well as the many department heads who provided feedback uh, along the way up until the last possible moment and then some. Any questions for the town administrator? I will say, though, I really enjoyed the budget process that you used this year. I think it was really helpful to understand the full scope in every department of what their, where their needs are. Knowing, we knew going into it, we'd never be able to do 100% of them. But I think it is really helpful for us to look out. And I think they did a great job. So the ones that didn't get what they asked for, I know it's disappointing, but continue to keep updating your budget and get ready for next year and continue to keep advocating for yourself. And this is a great process and I think it works and I think sooner or later hopefully we continue um, the positive cash flow we'll get there so thank you everybody all the departments for all the work you put into it but we won't be approving this until the May 6th meeting correct we'll ask for a vote of the board on May right. 6th so um, you know this there isn't any further feedback we'll prepare the budget accordingly yeah. so if people have questions please come on May 6th That'll be your night to give us your final input, and we'll make an approval at that point. Can I get the school department budget to hearing as well? Scott? Wednesday. Wednesday. The, the workshop is no, Wednesday. No, the workshop is Wednesday. The hearing is on Monday. Same as us, I believe. So, Michael, thank you for all your time as well. All right, so that brings us to uh, the next phase of this, which will be some license renewals, go over the town administrator's evaluation wrap it up with some minutes legal bills Finish town the report okay the we did. I am uh, I am gonna take a minute and use the facilities but we can continue on with the license renewal mr. O'Leary mr. chairman I move to renew the pool table license for sports spirits and stakes 178 Main Street to expire May 1st 2020 second. I have a motion and a second any discussion None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Uh, we have a small presentation, I think, Ms. Minipelli? Yes. So this year in the TA's evaluation, I turned the responsibility over to the vice chair this year. So she ran with it. I uh, thank the board members for getting the input into Mr. Collins, uh, who isn't here tonight, but it needs a, a debt of gratitude for all the work he did pulling this all together. There is a handout. I will allow Mrs. Uh, Minyapelli take it over from here. I'm just going to step out for a second. Pass it down. Yeah. Pass it down. Yeah. While, you're, while you're moving that forward, which is only really brief, briefly, three or four slides, one of which is the title page, so you can move it along from there. Uh, thank you to Bob Collins for putting this together. I really didn't do much with it, um, but we did have the opportunity to kind of review the results which are being passed along to you now. And uh, we'll do a quick summary um, of the results of this. You could see where, where Mr. Gilberto started off. He already was at an outstanding performance range. <laughs> so, that one's good. 
That one. Okay. Um, and so he's uh, he's uh, evaluated on five different professional competencies really here, and we see that his competency evaluation scores. Are, uh, this this is just an explanation, a summary of what those what those are. He scored a 48.7 out of 50 in his relationship with the board, a 38.9 out of 40 in fiscal management, 39.5 out of 40 in community and public relations, 47.5 out of 50 in personal personnel administration, and 49.1 out of 50 in professional skills and abilities. And um, got a lot of feedback on all of the, the great things that, that he does and that he does so well. The next slide, I think, is where we see he, he's, his overall rating that he achieved is 223.8 out of a possible 230. He's well within the outstanding range. And, um, and if you go to the next slide, it, it really shows, however, this is his five-year trajectory his summary. He's, he's, even though he started out with high marks, he's still achieved an increase in points. We really don't have that much more to, to go with him. He's almost at a perfect score. Two gold so. stars for you. Yeah, so, so his, his goal would be to reach a, a to achieve a, a perfect score for the next one. By yeah, the but then there's only one way to go. <laughs> I'd hold it even. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, as you can see, over the past, of, over the, oh, it's, it's supposed to be a five year summary, actually. Over the past five years, he's done quite well with um, the evaluations because he does work work well. And we all have commented to him previously about his work ethic and how much we appreciate his dedication and effort um, that he brings to the position. And that's it. If there's any questions, the commentary is more set forth more fully in the in the written evaluation that was just passed out. But we thank you. thank you. We thank your family. We appreciate your commitment. We hope to it continues. And those. I think we did the evaluation this year without violating any open meeting law <laughs> <laughs> for the first time ever. Thanks we, to Mrs. Minifelli. I don't think we. we um, <laughs> So and with that, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the 2019 Town Administrator <coughs> Evaluation and to authorize the Chairman to sign the evaluation. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any last words? I would just say yes, Mr. Gilbert. I just would say that you know, the evaluation reflects the hard work of the dozens employees of the Town of North Reading. And I, I want to thank them all for their effort, you know, the, the many that we see before us for budget presentations or for uh, otherwise. Uh, down to the employees who uh, every day keep us safe who we may not see here in this room and we all know and see in the community so i just want to say thank you to all of them thank you mr chair you're welcome and it, it is true what you're saying but at the end of the day we are evaluating you on a base of uh, on the basis of the ratings and the, and the review uh, sheets and you really have achieved this as an individual you've earned every bit of those scores that are up there and i thank you for the years you've been here and I wish you the best of luck going forward. And I'm sure your reviews will continue to trend in the same direction. And uh, congratulations. So nothing else said. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the board. Thank you. OK. Minutes. April 1st, 2019, regular and executive session. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the April 1st, 2019 regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Not heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the April 1st, 2019 executive session minutes as written. Second. second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? Not heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. <clears throat> Legal bills. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills for February 2019 in the amount of $9,243.73 as follows. Copelman and Page PC General, $2,515.73. 
Copeland and Page PC Labor, $3,021. Thompson West, $3,707. Total, $9,243.73. Second. A motion and a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Town Administrator's report. Mr. Chairman, through you, I have two items. The first is that I, I wish to congratulate um, former building superintendent Julie Spurrer Knight in her pursuit of a fantastic career opportunity as the business manager at the Newbury Depart Newburyport Department of Public Works. Julie worked for the town for nearly 20 years, uh, over 16 of which were with the school department, and the last three and a half of which were as building superintendent. And I think it would be difficult to find an employee who had had such an impact in such a short period of time uh, here in the town hall. Uh, in her time as superintendent, Julie modernized our building maintenance and repair programs. Uh, town employees and the public have all benefited from her efforts, be it in clean, albeit dated buildings, and very responsive building maintenance staff. As one employee said to me recently, she truly worked endlessly to make the facilities department a department you could count on. Julie's also overseen a number of building renovation projects, including at the library within Town Hall and at the fire department. We all wish Julie well in this fantastic opportunity in which she will be able to utilize her skills and education more fully. Julie, thank you for your service to the town. Her last day was Friday, April 19th. To our employees and the public, uh, we ask that you bear with us as we move forward in filling Julie's position. I'm sure that there will be some impacts on us, but we are committed to moving uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, Julie's first day uh, new report was today. Um, I, I hope that it was a, a good day for her there. Um, and uh, certainly our loss will be their gain, but a fantastic opportunity for her. I'm happy for her, though. She yeah. did certainly a great progression for her. Absolutely. And you know, the position she took if you read about it, it's really a position that I hope someday that you will bring into your administration. <coughs> and it's a lot of value that could bring to, especially with the types of buildings we have and the uh, infrastructures. Uh, I think it would be great. Thank you. But, you know, I think her because we sit in this room and we don't smell mold, <laughs> right? We sit in comfortable chairs. In her short period of time, no she got a lot changed. And I thank her for our comfort as we're in here for five or six hours at, at a time. So, But I wish her best of luck. She yeah. deserves it. Well, she'll be missed. Definitely. And then my second note is just uh, the town planner and I have recently been made aware of new federal law governing the installation of so-called 5G small cell wireless networks uh, that went into effect April 14th. The new law limits the regulation of these networks by cities and towns. These networks allow for data communication from wireless devices placed throughout a community rather than the, the uh, traditional cell tower data communication system. Uh, the Town Planner and the Community Planning Commission are working with Town Council and DPW regarding a procedure and design guidelines, guidelines for these networks, which I anticipate will be forwarded to the board for consideration at a future meeting. So I just want to make the board aware of that. There was a bit of a dust up that happened in a number of communities nearby. Um, I, I think it came to a surprise as meant to, to many of us, although um, to the credit of Copeland and Page, they have advised us you know, that um, we were, we were prepared to recommend action forthwith, but they, they are working on a policy for us to have. Um, and ultimately, you know, we do need to nail down design guidelines, which I thank Danielle and the CPC for working on. But we'll be back to the board with that later on. So are these, are these like nodules that, that, that the Comcast has around town? Uh, yeah, wires? I mean, I don't know how it, it, it's, so it it's exactly, and they're small devices that can be mounted on telephone poles or similar infrastructure for building a, a, a network. And um, they're, um, the ability to regulate them are they're they're regulated um they're they're, they're we're, our ability to regulate them has been restricted recently um by uh, actions at the federal level presumably to cause for the proliferation of these communication systems out there um, some of the pictures that we've seen are, are not consistent with certainly our historic town center uh, not consistent with the design guidelines that we'd like to see or i should say the design standards that we'd like to see on say main street um, so we want to be prepared for uh, when and if that time comes. We've had, you know, I've been before this board to talk about some of the concerns that have come up from our uh, cellular tower lessees uh, regarding uh, their use of our towers. And they, you know, uh, appear to be desire to continue to be here and, and, and investing in the infrastructure in that capacity. But the technology indicates that there may be other, other, another wave, you know, out there that we just need to be prepared to manage should it show up here. 
Excuse me, Mr. Masseri. Michael, uh, I don't know if you remember that when Verizon started putting in their wireless networks, not the wireless network, the broadband networks, mm -hmm. they were putting the uh, hardware very low on the poles until we raised a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. So I think that may be a potential issue too. Yeah, that's I think where it's. Where they put this stuff. I think that's exactly the concern. So, is that uh, those regulations the town has to put? Place? That's correct. The board would need to approve them, and we're, we're okay. working on a template with town council. Uh, but it's more than it's regulations, but it's really design guidelines. You know, how do you want this stuff to look? Mm -hmm. and I don't know if Malden's gone through this um, the vice, to the vice chair, but we we did, and actually we're working. My office is working on a revamping, although. It was out when we implemented the small cell ordinance, and so we we kind of, you know, mirrored the shot clock. You have to do the shot clock requirements. You have to do the deadlines mm -hmm. for when the petition comes to you and a decision is made. And you have to make sure that you're charging the application fee appropriately and the annual fees capped as well. Okay. So there's a lot of things like that that should be in your guidelines or your regulation that the that they're going to adopt but it's more of um, letting the technology be ushered in and not you know interfering or disrupting with it I think was kind of the mandate that came down with that okay. FCC directive how's the revenue stream look it's 500 an initial application I think is the cap okay and then I think it's a capped licensing much smaller than that annual renewal licensing fee okay. so I think ours was at a higher so we have to go back and look at it in Malden and revamp I think ours was 500 annual renewal based upon keeping a record of all of these all over the town you know mm -hmm. of course it's a different it's a different scenario if we if you own the polls in Malden we own a lot of the utility polls okay. So it's a different scenario versus having it on another another utilities polls. Mm. So, Mrs. Sorry. What happens if a car breaks, drives into a pole, or a truck and breaks the pole? Like we just had a pole replaced last week on Haverhill Street, and you have one of these mini cell tower things on there. Is that going to affect someone's network as to whether they're going to get their, their internet? I mean, what, what's the implication of that? So right now they're on, you know, big structures or water towers, so the cars are not going to drive into them. But once they're on a utility pole, they can be affected by storms or being taken down in an accident. So what is the implication of the network? I'm not a, I'm not an engineer, but my understanding of this technology versus it being on the cell towers is this is a mu much more uh, advanced technology, and they'll be throughout the they'll be on poles throughout the city, taking up a smaller space, but more of them, so that they'll be more directed to the area recipients versus wiping out a whole a whole section. So that's my understanding, although I'm not a. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to be drawing. Oh, yeah, there's their, They're going to be drawing their connection from their broadband connections to their rock and the poles. So they're basically little antenna boxes that will be all over the various locations based on the technology range. So one goes down, it doesn't mean the whole system right. goes down. It has a redundant design in it, from what I understand. So if what? one does go down. It has a redundancy design. Well, in there'll the way. be other other locations broadcasting, yeah. so you might be like, caught in an area where the yeah. signal is low or very bad. Yep. But just think about it today. You know, you got uh, various uh, wireless towers providing your phone service, and one of them goes down. You know, you might lose your connectivity. You go to another part of town, and you're okay. Yeah. In this case, the range is smaller, the quantity will go up. Uh, the higher the uh, band rate, the higher the frequencies, the, the less, the, the shorter distances it can go before it's lost. So that's why there'll be more of them. Anything else? No, sir. Mr. O'Leary? Just uh, 
A couple of things. Just again, I was very impressed again with the presentation uh, earlier this evening on the, on the food pantry's new home. And, and again, just uh, for the people at home, again, just to support support the cause. It's, it's, it's terrific. It's a wonderful gesture on the part of the Union Congregational Church and uh, donating the space and working towards the renovations. And they need to raise you know, a lot of money. It should be supported. It's, it's great, great effort. And uh, just secondly, uh, I'm glad Stop and Shop settled the the contract, and it was, uh, I was, uh, you know, of course, working out on Main Street quite a bit, and uh, I was hard to see that a lot of people, you know, supported the workers uh, through a very difficult time, and and now you can go back and support the local business and keep these people working. So I'm glad they came to a settlement. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masseri. I've just been in kind of a prep to say goodbye, and at the same time take whatever knowledge I do have and try to get it out to uh, new board members and, and hopefully we can have a cut over and change over with good continuity. Sure. continuity. I'm a little disappointed we haven't been able to move the water project and get the FEIR filed yet because of the issue with the uh, getting uh, nailed on a location for the chlorine injection systems on Route 28. But that'll come. It's just a matter of uh, keeping focus on it. Yeah. And I'm glad to know that Steve O'Leary will uh, continue on the board and continue. I'm sure there's an opening on the Water Commission for you. Hopefully on the water. <laughs> <laughs> Special designation, maintaining the, maintaining the uh, job yeah. <laughs> maybe that wouldn't be a bad well, idea that'll be, be your bad idea. i'll tell Absolutely. you mr masseri has been invaluable through this whole process um through the negotiations of the contract with andover to begin with i mean that in and of itself mm -hmm. was a huge undertaking and uh, he was invaluable in his uh, keeping me calm and uh, didn't didn't uh, didn't help as far as how late the meetings went, but how long they went. But uh, <laughs> uh, really, he, the, the service that he's provided, not just on that, but I mean, over 46, 45 years, 46 years of service uh, has been uh, tr tremendous and a godsend to the community. And so not, again, my message to the board is to keep focus on that area. And by the way, past happy because birthday. you know we have a contract with Andover, but we're going to get the state approval. Mm -hmm. That requires a couple of loops to jump through. Well, we appreciate you spending your birthday with us this evening. Oh. You know, last five hours. Well, fortunately, happy, happy yesterday 49th. was a holiday. <laughs> we had all our relatives. Yeah. And we had a birthday celebration then. So. Well, happy birthday to you. Thank you. God bless. Anything else? No. Mr. Schultz? Yes, yeah, real quick, uh, to pick on what Steve just said, the food pantry, something I've been working on with the church for a while. I have a member there. And uh, it's going to be a great situation they're going to have literally about four times the size of what they have now that's going to be ADA compliant they're going to have what the, the refrigeration they need and everything's going to be right there and it's right next to the senior center I mean it's a real win-win for the town so please try to support that the best you can if you can donate money for it great I think it's going to help a lot of people who are in need I'm sure uh, the department heads are already fighting for that space yeah, I'll move in there. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great office for you. You, you like being on stage? It really would. Nice and private. <laughs> behind the stage. Behind the stage. <laughs> Don't pay, pay attention, attention to the man behind, behind the curtain. <laughs> the real wizard of Oz. <laughs> Anything uh, else, Mr. Schultz? No. <laughs> it has probably. benefits for the food pantry and town hall residents. New archives. He's hoping they leave some food in there. <laughs> um, just, a, just a somewhat of a public public safety announcement because it's getting nicer out and kids are going out on their bikes and they're playing out in the streets and they're walking around and stuff like that just for people to be careful as they're driving around. That's all. Good. Um, I only have a couple things. You know, the President of the United States gets to pardon people as he walks out of office and I get to, the only power I have is I get to designate liaisons on uh, different boards. So. Uh, tonight, I would like to ask Mr. O'Leary if you wouldn't mind joining Mr. Schultz as a second liaison to the Zoning, zoning Board of Appeals. And the reason for my request is we do have some pending potential 40B project coming. And I think it's important that we give the abutters the most, uh, the most experienced folks we have and uh, the people that can provide the most 
council as we go through this process as it's coming <coughs> along. So, Mr. O'Leary, you don't mind. I would like to ask you to be a second liaison matter to that board. I think it's important. And then hopefully whomever is chair will take this uh, appointment that I made and continue it forward. Uh, and hopefully you will advocate for that as well. Okay? Very good. Thank uh, you. And I mentioned the Memorial Day. I think it's important to make sure that you guys don't forget that, okay? By the 10th, somebody's got to let them know. And that's all I have. And I look forward to Mr. Vasseri and I. The last meeting is on May 6th. It will be a bittersweet evening, but um, I am excited for the new board members. I know they do well and with three knowledgeable members to help co counsel them along. Um, but as Mr. Masseri has said, we're both going to be in town still. We're both available to help in any way we can help the board. I think that's the most important thing. We're, we're still around. You're so. still on 20 committees. What's that? You're still on 20 committees. Yeah, not anymore. Uh, but I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Adjourn. <laughs>